in there. We are recording. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we are here for the uh, Tuesday, uh, February 16th uh, town council meeting. Uh, this is a um, regular town council meeting and per the executive order of the governor, uh, this is uh, being done remotely, but it is recorded uh, both live on YouTube and will be um, kept up uh, on YouTube for, uh, uh, for the duration of this meeting, as well as uh, on um, our local channel uh, four, or 16 to be able to watch uh, as well for those cable subscribers. Um, Councilman Hill, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Do. Pledge of Allegiance, flag of the United States of America, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty for all, justice for all. Thank you, Councilman. And uh, I did see Sue on here. Sue, if you would, uh, attendance for tonight, please. Okay. Councillor Biggs? Present. Councillor Flanagan? Here. Councillor Forrest? Present. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor O'Connor? Here. Councilwoman Pelletier? Here. Councilor Pentelo? Here. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella? Here. And Mayor Rell? Here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sue. We appreciate that. And, uh, and thank you to our uh, legislative delegation for being here with us tonight. Uh, I appreciate you guys taking out of uh, your, your busy, busy schedule to be with us tonight. Uh, I, I do know, looking at a lot of the Zooms and uh, YouTube channels um, for the legislature, you guys definitely have your hands full of juggling uh, a number of committee meetings and public hearings. Uh, so again, I do appreciate you guys uh, taking some time to be here with us. Um, I don't know if there's in any particular order that you guys want to go in. Um, you know, Representative Morin Bello is very comfortable being on this Zoom and the, uh, the other eight of us that are on here uh, as she served with us uh, with distinction over the last couple of years. Uh, I don't know if I wanna have you open it up or if you wanna do it for your you know, senior delegation members to, to start off, but uh, you know, I'll open up the floor uh, to have you guys um, kind of just give us a brief summary of what's going on. I know the governor had uh, put out his uh, budget proposal last Wednesday. And, uh, you know, there are the what we call the runs for the municipalities ECS funding. Um, just uh, didn't know if there's anything in particular with the governor's budget. Uh, I see Senator Fonfera uh, is on. Uh, if you wanted to talk about any possible bonding for uh, for Weathersfield that uh, um, either may be in the works or if there's something that we can help um, push forward to the legislature for consideration. Uh, we'll be happy to do that. Otherwise, you know, the floor is yours to, to talk about some of the things that are going on up in Hartford and uh, the effects that uh, any proposals may have on uh, Weathersfield residents. So I'll open it up to you guys and, uh, um, you know, we'll be a lot nicer than, you know, some of those public uh, comments that are coming across uh, some of the public hearings that we're watching right now. So Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Um, I'd be happy to go first as the um, as the newest member. I you know obviously know the least of what's going on in some of the other committees that I'm not serving on. So I'm glad that Senator Fonfair is here and can give us um, in, you know insight into the governor's budget. I did see his uh, address last week and I'm starting to look through that budget. But certainly would. Uh, be happy to have Senator Funfair to talk about that. Um, we have had a busy uh, beginning to the session. We've had over 3,000 bills that were introduced, along with all the committee bills that are being worked on. And you know, a lot of them won't make it out of committee, but um, you know, we have a lot of work to do within within the committees. 
Um, I serve on transportation, GAE, and internships. So uh, transportation, we're meeting with uh, the DOT and DMV and Port Authority and the Airport Authority and listening to what their needs are. We're um, uh, talking about pedestrian safety. We have um, are having conversations with the governor just signing on to the Transportation Climate Initiative. Um, in GAE, we're talking about uh, voting reform bills, including automatic voter registration, no excuse absentee balloting, and early voting. Um, and then uh, internships, we've placed interns with our legislators so that um, college students can have the ability to work with our, with our uh, legislators up at the Capitol. Unfortunately, this year it is virtual. Um, and outside of the committees, um, I'm working on, you know, advocating for our frontline workers to get their COVID-19 vaccine. We've really heard a lot from our educators, and I think it's super important to get teachers vaccinated so that we can get all of our kids back in school full time. It's important for the, our kids, both mental and physical health, but it's also important just to get our workforce to a place where they're able to go back to work. Um, a lot of women have uh, found it difficult to try to homeschool or to do distance learning with their kids um, and try to work. So we've, we've lost women in our workforce and that's something that we need to look at moving forward. And then the other thing is, um, you know, uh, Rep Wood and Senator Lesser and I have uh, had conversations with others about the auto thefts and people rummaging through cars um, you know, it's a national issue and it's had a, a big uptick during COVID. And so um, we are trying to work through that and see how we as legislators can help and working with our police chiefs and um, residents to try to come up with some solutions. Um, I was unable to attend a meeting that Chief Satran invited me to last week. I was in quarantine, um, happy to be out of it, but I don't know if uh, Rep Wood has, you know, stuff, any information to add. Um, on how that meeting went, if you were able to attend. So um, that's what I've been working on. And, uh, you know, after everybody's had a chance to speak, I'd be happy to try to answer some questions. Thank you. Um, Senator Fonfera. Seeing that uh, my other two colleagues haven't come off of mute, I guess uh, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, look, I think some of you know uh, my irreverence when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, I don't give a lot of credence to what the governor proposes, particularly this governor, frankly. Um, um, sure, we have to deal with them and he's got one vote. We've got to put together, you know, the majority in two chambers. Um, but nonetheless, it is a proposal and whether you like it or you don't like it, it's a proposal and uh, we'll, we'll respond in kind. Um, not a lot of boldness on his part. Uh, he's uh, status quo seems to be pretty much fine for him. It's not for me. Uh, we have an economy that is um, on its knees. And um, yeah, he's, he's been smart enough to, to protect some key areas and Municipal funding, obviously, is most important to you folks, and I understand that, and I agree with it. Um, but there's no effort, despite what he ran on, um, to look at property tax reform in Weathersfield. You know, I represent both Harpen and Weathersfield, but Weathersfield, at what is your mill rate, 40 and change right now? Yes, 40.69. Yeah. And um, I think you folks do a wonderful job. Whoever is in the majority, you, you work hard and you do a great job in all the years I've been representing Weathersfield of managing your funds, getting the most out of it. Um, but as you know, you have a town that is a limited ability to grow, limited commercial, virtually no industrial. That's a tough recipe, man. That's a, just that, that's really hard, and so um, you need more help from the state. Um, and and we need to be more creative. We need to stand by our commitments. We in the finance committee today talked about MRSA, which 
is now being suspended in the governor's proposal anyway. I don't know what Weathersfield would realize from that. Gary, do you have a, a number that you would, uh, what Weathersfield would expect if that were fully enrolled? I, I missed the beginning part, Senator, I'm sorry. Uh, MRSA, what would Weathersfield have realized if we did not suspend the program uh, starting in July? Do yeah, you know what that would be? Offhand, I don't, yeah, I don't have the yeah. number offhand. It's not chump change, no. uh, I know that much, and, um, and it would really help the town, but under his proposal, we wouldn't, because it's 300 and something million dollars across the board, and therefore, um, he doesn't want to look at avenues of, of uh, ident identifying that revenue to be able to fund it, but we make these commitments, and then we don't, our reputation is, um, not a good one when it comes to supporting and, and living up to our commitments. So um, we have a bill that would um, fully fund um, uh, MRSA. We'll see how far we can get with that. It has to be part of the conversation. I mean, there are a lot of other things going on, but in terms of Weathersfield, certainly that's a major one if we were successful in adding um, not having it uh, uh, fully suspended for the next two years. Some people think we ought to eliminate it entirely. I disagree with that. Um, our towns, our cities and towns in this state are, are left um, with just one tax. And that's in many more and more towns in this state, they've exhausted the ability of that, that tax to do its job. And yet there's not serious consideration being given to alternatives. I'll just close by saying on that score, most states, many states in the country share some revenue with, with towns. New York state allows counties to use up to 4% on their sales tax, 4%. And there's never any question about it. There's no argument. There's no taking it back by the state. Um, and we can't get there. We just can't see The state believes every dime it raises is owned by the state. And even if it if it deigns to give a town something, it will pull it back just as quick. So um, that, that's uh, uh, just a fundamental um, uh, reality in, in the Connecticut legislature. It doesn't matter who the governor is, it's the same thing. So we hope we can make some progress on MRSA or some other ways of funding towns. I know there's Marty Looney's bill, which got a lot of attention today in the finance committee on pilot. I think Weathersfield will do better under that, certainly do no worse, but we hope we'll be successful in bringing more dollars through pilot uh, to Weathersfield under that initiative. I'll, I'll stop there. And just to follow up on that, I, I was following that pilot proposal that it, it's a three tier system of, uh, of pilot. Um, is there, you know, you mentioned, you know, most municipalities would, you know, um, look favorably to that proposal. Um, you'd mentioned Weathersfield. Is it because of uh, state-owned property that we have? Yes. Um, yep. I don't know the run. Um, we can get that to you, what Weathersfield would do on it, but no one would do any worse. And I, I will hope and work towards, and I know the delegation will work towards having Weathersfield do better under this proposal. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Senator Lesser, or nope, sorry. <laughs> Representative Wood went, you guys know the game. Senator, I, I, it doesn't matter, but you. thank you for recognizing me. I'm a little loopy. I, I literally have been in front of my computer since early this morning, so I apologize. But thank you for having me. I, I, I love coming in front of uh, Weathersfield and uh, everyone and having these discussions. And I know we have talked about this before, but I do plan on um, organizing a working group to talk about pro property tax reform. Um, and I know that Councilman uh, Forrest had said that he wants to be on there, um, but we need to be talking about property tax reform at the state level. Um, I had thought that was being worked on coming into this session. I started asking around and uh, I heard a lot of crickets. So. I'm looking forward to that discussion, but I am um, on the Commerce Committee, which I have a lot of great news um, on because we're always working on economic growth and 
um, like a state innovation lab and, you know, working with our biotech sector and helping our manufacturers and small business loans. And I mean, I just love the committee because, you know, we're talking about ways to grow the economy and invest in our state's businesses. So uh, always a lot of great stuff coming out of there. I am co-chair of the Insurance and Real Estate Committee with Senator Lesser. And uh, we are working on, in particular, uh, health uh, insurance costs and lowering them, um, whether through um, looking at high deductible plans, um, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, um, just a lot of great proposals coming out of the committee. But additionally, there is um, a captive insurance bill, which is another revenue generator for the state, which is uh, growing our um, domicile here in Connecticut for the captive insurers, and that was included in the governor's budget. So, um, you know, that's a good policy that we're working on. And um, regarding bonding, I have not heard any requests from Weathersfield, so I am all ears on how we can help you guys and put in any bonding requests, and perhaps um, someone else in the delegation is already working on it, but I would be very supportive and, um, you know, taking the next step there with you all. Um, and then crime, you know, uh, we just had a uh, carjacking by gunpoint. I think there was one in Weathersfield and also in Rocky Hill yesterday. I feel like I'm working on this issue constantly, um, but dealing, my way of working on things is through the legislative process. So I really wish I could say we passed a bill yesterday that would, you know, um, help this situation, but it just doesn't work like that. We do have to go through you know, the process and it takes time and it's been very stressful. Um, I have kept in touch with our um, local chiefs, our local law enforcement, our state police. We had a meeting with uh, Commissioner Ravella last week. Uh, we are doing everything in our power. I think the good news is that with the dozens of bills addressing this topic, the, judi the judiciary did raise a concept um, either last week or this week um, that I think will combine a lot of the good parts of the many bills. So I'll definitely keep everyone posted on how that, pro how that progresses forward. And it was a, you know, productive meeting with the chiefs, but they're also feeling frustrated with, you know, the laws as well. So listening to them, I think is a great way forward and just making sure we all work together. Okay. I appreciate that. Senator Lesser. Thank you, uh, Mayor, and all. Uh, since I'm batting cleanup and my colleagues have discussed many of the important issues, I'll, I'll probably be uh, very brief. Uh, I just want to underscore uh, what Senator Farah mentioned a minute ago, which is you know, the real opportunity we have right now that I think we're uh, in danger of missing uh, to really rebalance uh, the state's uh, taxation uh, and to address the uh, broken property tax system that has gone uh, unaddressed for so long. So. Um, I'm really uh, grateful that he's the chair of the finance committee. He's in a real position uh, to help provide some relief. Um, happy to work with him on it and make sure that uh, uh, that remains a priority uh, for the session. Um, uh, Representative Wood mentioned, uh, we are the uh, co-chairs of the insurance uh, committee. And so the uh, uh, insurance capital of Connecticut, I guess, has moved from Hartford down to, to Weathersfield, I guess. Um, <laughs> But uh, we're, we spend an awful lot of time uh, working together, and uh, and she's been uh, she's absolutely right. We're working to find ways to support uh, small businesses, lower costs, make healthcare uh, more affordable. Uh, working together on that, and uh, uh, working with uh, Representative Bellow, uh, we put in a, a, a criminal justice bill focused on the car theft issue, and also a public health issue uh, bill, making sure that we're we're taking care of one Weatherfield family that had a, a bad healthcare. Uh, situation. So I'm happy to get to work for the community. There's a lot that's happening right now. One thing I would point out, uh, governor's budget does seem to um, uh, rely on uh, some federal support that we got last year uh, and reduces education funding accordingly. So just making sure that uh, we're providing more support to uh, towns right now. I know that you need support uh, as we manage the after effects of the pandemic is, is important. So we'll be working with you and your representatives to make sure that Weathers Field is fairly funded, especially uh, if we can get more uh, federal assistance uh, in the very near term. Mayor, uh, if I could just jump in real quick. Mayor uh, Representative Bellow did mention about bonding and this governor uh, loathes bonding, uh, particularly for legislators. Um, 
Uh, he, his people promise um, a bond commission, more bond commission meetings. He's had um, a, a woeful track record on meetings, never mind what's in those meetings and on the agenda. And those are generally skeleton uh, uh, agendas. So it's really been a disappointment with this governor. He's a Greenwich multimillionaire and God bless him. I don't, I don't uh, have any issue with that whatsoever, but he doesn't have an understanding of the legislative process. And I'll speak very um, parochially about it. That's the mother's milk for many legislators. Um, and he has no clue about the value of it and what it could do for him in terms of getting votes for his agenda. Uh, he's missed his vote entirely, but more importantly, in terms of what we can bring home. And, um, you know, we've done some good things for Weathersfield with bonding over the years, and we want to continue that, but he makes it really hard. We have a bill in committee again this year. Um, members of the finance committee uh, two years ago voted unanimously across the board, Democrat and Republican, in favor of changing the bonding process, the bond commission process. So it's it's more equitable that the legislature plays a, a, a more significant role. Right now, what we do every two years is, well, every year, every, every um, a budget year, we do a two-year uh, bond um, package, about 1.5, 1.8, depending on the year, somewhere in there, billion dollars that we, we hand over to the governor, and then we beg to get a few shekels uh, out of the guy. Um, Dan Malloy was the opposite. He never met a bond uh, initiative that he wouldn't do. I love them for that. Um, but this guy is the other, the other way and projects that, by the way, I laugh, I'll just end it by saying this. I laugh when I walk by uh, the uh, Web Dean Stevens, the addition, the education, and there's a sign that has his name up there. He had nothing to do with that project. He just happened when the sign went up he was governor, but he wouldn't have done that project. He would never have done that project. The state office building, which he went and said, what a lavish structure, this is wonderful. He would never have done that, that project. That building is a beautiful renovation, a real credit to the state. He wouldn't have done it. So uh, I say that it's gonna be a challenge, but, but the bill that we're putting in to say that there's gonna be, um, the legislature will have an ability to set the agenda along with the governor as opposed to he alone setting it and that the legislature will have a role in what, how many meetings there will be in the course of the year. That may end up being negotiated somehow, I'm sure it will, but um, the fact that everybody in the finance committee two years ago voted unanimously to vote that bill out says a lot about how legislators on either side of the aisle in either chamber feels about um, having a more equitable process. So we'll keep you posted on that. Thank you, Senator. And I, for one, believe strongly that uh, the legislature does make uh, good governors. You should be uh, experienced in the legislature before uh, you run. But uh, I say that in a personal way and not a, uh, <laughs> uh, an attack. Yeah, yeah. The governors of the past have, uh, have always, um, you know, benefited municipalities with uh, with bond money and uh, you know for that we are very grateful uh, for but uh, you know it for the public it's not just simply um, to you know provide funding to the municipality many of the bond projects are for um, schools uh, town buildings as well as um, you know various cultural uh, institutions so they uh, they are benefits uh, I think the practice of, of you know giving out, money for you know certain um you know pet p pet projects is is long gone and uh, we do appreciate uh, not only you but uh, your colleagues advocating for uh, the needs of weathersfield uh, i'll open it up to anybody with any questions for uh for the delegation councilman forrest thank you very much mayor and and this is just uh, also for the delegation, just some food for thought as you guys go in and continue to deliberate. And first, I want to say congratulations to Senator Lesser. Seen the, I've seen the Facebook photos. I think they're great. You know, I put the little heart on there and way to go, you know, and all that. And so did, so did hundreds of other people. But uh, in person, you know, it's always good to uh, 
it's great to see you grow, having your grown family. So, um, thank you. You'll understand my uh, the dark circles under my eyes. Uh, oh, understand it. I, many of the people that I'm looking at right now understand it well. <laughs> We've all, most of us have all been there. Um, but I'm sort of on issues. I want to just give you guys a heads up as we move forward. I, I think it's it's dead on that we talk about a uh, variety of revenue sources to to help you know more have a more balanced budget from where the resources come from instead of just property tax. That's pretty obvious. But I wanted to sort of inform you guys that um, there was a bipartisan effort at the end of our last budget to uh, almost act if the state isn't going to sort of make some dramatic reforms that at least we start, start to put in effort. Um, we're thinking about an, uh, an town endowment concept, which may, um, and, uh, and that was part of our budget process to, to create a committee to start down that path and talk about what that might look like. It's in its infancy as far as a concept, but if we look at our municipality as something that goes into perpetuity, just like our state, can we start saving and putting forward some resources that we set aside every year that then we'll start to run our, our, our annual budget, at least even if it's in, in portion. Um, and then year after year, we can start to chip away at the reliability um, you know, solely on the people that are living here you know, at this moment in time and how much money they have. So that might be start part of a broader conversation that you guys move forward. And I'd love to be able to continue that concept. And, and that, that moved through a unanimous vote uh, last year here that we were gonna start looking at that. Uh, in case uh, you know, in case there was no change in the revenue sources from the state, we had to start to act up by ourselves. Uh, next, um, we do have some quality of life issues. Obviously, you know about the cars situation, but there are more. Um, there's a lot of talk now about fireworks that are coming up more and more about all, from all areas of our town, um, and we've had different quality of life issues. Litter is also popping up more and more these days. Um, and, and just a thought as we continue down both discussions, quality of life and also revenue sources that as we can maybe have fines that are implemented and so on and so forth and, and people start to move through the court system, sometimes in some fines there is remuneration back to the town or a portion. I can think of, I believe, like maybe drunk driving and, and things of that nature, but there could be different teeth that could be put in at the state level. So. If individuals are fined for these quality of life issues, um, you know, portion can be brought back to the town. And then also some additional teeth that might be installed. So for example, if you didn't pay your car tax, I believe now like you can't get your car, you know, re-registered or, or there's some process. So there could be other, if there's other civil infractions and to be able to provide uh, some teeth into that. So you might not be able to do something a person normally would until they sort of come uh, uh, come out of arrears, if you will. So there could be some concepts that, that might be able to move forward in that manner. We also talked to the MDC extensively and, and uh, Chairman DeBella, and we learned in our last review that maybe in the 1970s or the 1980s, the federal government started to really slow down funding some of those basic infrastructure that we have. Uh, and that we learned that it's somewhere in the 70 percentile uh, MDC was subsidized by the federal government and that that has dwindled down to, uh, we'll say next to nothing, but I don't want to misstate the facts. And it might be time that we as a group, a legislature, legislative crew and as a town and maybe multiple towns got together and say, maybe it's time for the federal government to start stepping up that subsidy so that the towns don't bear that extensive burden and the cities. And that might be a real conversation to have. Uh, you know, we obviously are paying off these huge debts on the consent order to build the infrastructure, but it looks like that mentality in Washington has sort of gone away. And perhaps with this new revival of inf infrastructure, these new infrastructure bills that we're hearing in Washington, we could start to turn that tide and that would help us uh, with our responsibility to just have clean drinking water, which is the, the basis. Um, and then two more issues I have here are um, infrastructure, not necessarily as it comes to water, but especially with Senator Fonfara, but the whole group. Um, I have been talking to some people about a telecom infrastructure in town, especially when it comes to commercial, providing fiber optic commercial along the Salestine Highway and other commercial sectors in, in Wethersfield, at least, in order to start to improve and increase our taxability and our commercial zones. Um, along with uh, the along with the huge swaths of 
electric lines that go through Wethersfield. Um, those electric li lines take up a lot of land, like Pilot takes up a lot of land by the state. Those electric lines take up a lot of our commercial land and they're huge. Now in Hartford, of course, a lot of them run underground. So you're able to still have commercial over those corridors. But it seems with the maybe the lack of popularity of Eversource, uh, they still are regulated in some ways, that that is uh, something that the state in, in concert with the towns, but especially Wethersfield, we can look to maybe burying those power lines, which would increase the resiliency, of course, in storms. I know it's been talked about before. I understand it's a large number, but I think at, for Wethersfield in particular, this is something that's very important to our electric resiliency, but also in our ability to grow as a town commercially. And those corridors take up a tremendous amount of space. They look horrible and, um, and they're right they're right smack into our um, Salestein Highway zones. And lastly, just a heads up, the judicial branch is suffering badly. Um, we haven't had jury trials in almost a year and a half, which is the way in which we resolve our private disputes. Um, and when that changes, uh, there's no blame here, but it's a reality. When that changes, uh, we are going to need judges to hear cases and have trials. And those judges are gonna need clerks. Um, so just think about the resources for the judicial branch because we'll have a tremendous backlog in all areas from family to foreclosure to civil to criminal. Um, and it's, it's really going to be a needed effort. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, I can, you know, just piggyback off of one of those comments about, um, you know, property tax and, you know, revenue coming to the municipalities, you know, some things that the legislature might be able to do. I mentioned it in talking to one of the, the reporters about the uh, grand list, and I'll go into a little further detail later on. Um, but one thing that may, uh, you know, well, should help, but may be discussed at the uh, legislature this year uh, is, uh, you know, a requirement of property tax, uh, motor vehicle uh, taxes. Uh, there are a number, and we're seeing it more and more, of folks who register out of state. And, um, you know, that is uh, definite tax dollars, property tax dollars that could be, you know, kept here in the municipality, thus lessening the, you know, the, the need to knock on the door of our legislators to say, you know, we need more money down here. So if there's something uh, up at the legislature uh, you guys can do and, and look out for, for the municipalities, and, and, you know, it is a revenue source for us. But if there's something for motor vehicle taxes um, to be you know, kept here, if we can keep the, uh, the out-of-state registrations uh, at a minimum, um, it would help uh, the local property tax um, um, increase here in, in town. Anybody else with any questions or, or comments to uh, the legislators? Uh, Councilwoman Peltier. I just have a taxation question. Um, some of you have touched on the governor's budget. And one thing the governor, and I know not all of you uh, are on board with it, but one of the things he has pledged was to not raise taxes on state residents. And, um, but he's also relying on some concessions to be made from state employee unions. And I know the leadership of CBAC has uh, come out in strong opposition to any concessions and has called on um, the General Assembly to raise taxes on residents and a number of your colleagues have proposed bills that would raise taxes, including uh, the state income tax, as well as a surtax on capital gains, among others. Um, and I was just curious where um, you guys stand on um, whether you support the governor's pledge to not uh, raise taxes on residents and to uh, it, and would support um, you know the request for concessions or if you would uh, stand with the state employee unions and um, and some of your colleagues who are asking for tax increases and uh, so to, to fund the state employee raises in particular, I wanted to um, start with um, Representative Morimbello because I know that you're a staunch supporter of public sector unions and you've 
a lot of them endorsed you on your campaign. And uh, I was just curious where you stand on the issue. Sure. Um, I, I am um, in, I do support our, our union workers. Um, I think that if you look at our state workforce, they have been asked to um, give back time and time again. And I think that we do need to look at our tax system and our property taxes, but we can't continue to rely on um, our workforce to fund, you know, fund all of it. So I, I do support our unions. So would you support raising raising like income tax or, or the, some of your colleagues bill supporting um you know or the capital gains or there's some that would raise taxes on large businesses in the state sure so i um i'm not sitting on those committees i'm not i am waiting for to see some of those bills and how they do come out of committee um before i either support them or, or not support them um, you know, lots of bills are being raised by individuals and by committees and they're not going to all make it out and they're not all going to look like they started with. So um, I'm not supporting any of the, I'm not out there supporting bills until I see what they're going to look like when we get to a vote. Um, so that, that's where I'm standing right now. Councilwoman, I would just add, I think all four of us have said that we believe that taxes are too high on Weathersfield residents. Uh, and so, you know, for some of us talk about tax reform, um, and I think what that talks about is, is rebalancing our tax structure on uh, Wethersfield residents, which is what I care about. You know, I represent the folks from Wethersfield that do that uh, in the delegation. So um, how to get there, there I'm sure there are different, different ways to, to get there, but, um, you know, if you center the communities that we represent, uh, I think that's a, a good starting place. I would also just say that in the pandemic, uh, we've seen huge inequities in, in Connecticut. The reason our, and, and Senator Fatara knows a lot more about this than I do, uh, the reason our uh, uh, state's fiscal position has improved so markedly is because of uh, the strong performance of the stock market. There are and many people in Connecticut have never had it uh, as good as they are right now. Uh, but for families in our area, that's not necessarily the case. So um, I think we need to rebalance our tax structure to, to address that um, and to provide relief to people who are really struggling right now families and small businesses in the area. I'll, I'll just jump in here and say, uh, as uh, Representative Bellow said, that uh, it's a process and the governor makes his proposals. He proposes we dispose and we'll do our job and we will hear his bill and we'll hear bills that are to the contrary. And uh, the finance committee will act on revenue and we'll see where that takes us. Uh, we do we need more revenue to do things like property tax reform you heard me say a little while ago that if the bill that we passed a few years ago were to go into effect fully and not cut back as we've begun to do almost before we even started to fund it on MRSA Weathersfield would do very well your property tax I'm sure you would support uh, Congress, uh, council person Pelletier you'd support more revenue coming from Hartford to alleviate the enormous burden on Wethersfield residents because you have such a small commercial and, res and, and industrial tax base. So I don't think you'd have a problem if we were, were to pursue creative ways to find revenue to do that. Um, I'll let you speak for yourself, but I just my sense is that you would agree with it if we were to take that course. Um, I think most Wethersfield residents, my constituents in Wethersfield would support such an initiative. So it's not a black and white kind of thing by any means. And, and, and the governor's proposal is just that. And he will have to compromise just as we'll have to compromise in order to get a budget passed. But that's a long way to go. We will probably do that probably in late May, early June, we hope. And we'll, uh, we'll see where things lie at that point. But you have four people who are committed to working on behalf of this town to bring back the resources that it needs it needs more, and I believe the state should be a major player in providing more resources to Weathersfield, just like it, so many other towns in Connecticut need. And um, we'll hopefully do our job and be successful in, in delivering on some of those things. Thank you. It's, it's still not clear where these resources would come from. I mean, we, we need more revenue. I assume you are comfortable with 
some of the proposals to raise taxes on or make the tax system more progressive? Is that what I'm, I mean, I feel like there's some euphemisms being thrown around and I don't quite understand, but I, I do just want to say, you know, I know that um, Governor Malloy had raised taxes on the wealthy and that just drove a number of, you know, wealthy people out of the state. And I feel like that just leaves a hole for, you know, where we end up with like middle and working class families having to um, pay more to sustain the existing structure. And I know like the, uh, for example, the expansion of the uh, sales tax that is a regressive tax that is uh, disproportionately affects working families. But, you know, I, there's, I feel like what, what expansion are you referring to when there was a bunch of exemptions for property tax uh, exemptions and a few years ago we all of a sudden started having to pay i'm, I'm sorry not property tax uh, sales tax and all of a sudden we had to start paying a sales tax on services and on other things that have well i'll tell you i'll tell you about that councilman the, the reason we and i support strongly the expansion into services because our economy has changed dramatically in the last 20 30 years it was a production oriented uh, uh, economy and now we're a service oriented, uh, oriented economy and we get less and less revenue. It used to be the sales tax used to be the workhorse tax in Connecticut. And now it is not, no longer the case because so much of our, of our um, activity, economic activity is on the service side and yet there is strong resistance to extending for fairness purposes, extending the sales tax into services. And there's, there's, in my opinion, no reason why we ought to be resistant to that um, when, because now someone performs a service, it's not taxed, but if you build something, it is taxed. That's not, in my opinion, the best tax policy is one that is broad-based and as opposed to a ton of exemptions, that means that you pay and I don't, or you pay more and I don't, that's not a good tax structure. And Connecticut's income tax and its progressivity has has resulted in some of that, as well as its sales tax, which has every time you do an exemption in a sales tax, forget ever getting rid of it, because now there's a constituency around to keep that exemption, and so we have a very, um, un, un, in my opinion, unfair sales tax in that regard, because there are winners and there are a lot of losers the best thing we could do. If we got rid of the exemptions, our sales tax would be about 4%, maybe even a notch below four, but try to change some of those exemptions that have been built in, impossible. We've tried and we've tried and tried. Well, and I, finally, I just wanna say, you know, that there's a lot of talk about how we need more revenue and, and maybe that's true, but I think you, have, you also should look at the spending side. I think the state, um, you know, and in, in things you can, cut there because I feel like we're on an unsustainable path. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, uh, Councilor O'Connor. Yeah, I'd just like to first thank you, uh, Senator Fonfara and the rest of the delegation for attending tonight. I did want to, I kind of got lost on Representative Bellow's response to uh, Councilwoman question is I'm trying to understand so if the only way it comes down to giving the union raises is for the state to have a tax increase are you saying you support that um I am um, I'm looking at we are all looking at ways to raise revenue um and I don't know that it's one or the other right now Councillor O'Connor um, there are proposals for all sorts of things, including legalizing marijuana that would bring in revenue. There's talk of online, um, online gambling that would bring in revenue. There's talk in the transportation about, um, about um, a taxation on mileage on, on trucks. So there are, there are different proposals out there right now um, that would increase revenue. So I don't know that it's going to uh, come down to an either or an or situation at this point. We are looking at different options. But, but my question is, but if it does come down to an either or, 
are you going to support a tax increase so the union can get a raise? Yes, I think that that our workforce uh, deserves to be paid appropriately. And, and, and I would say I agree that our workforce deserves to be paid appropriately, but I would also remind you that there are a lot of people who are not union members who are suffering terribly because of the COVID crisis, who are foregoing raises, if even and living right now in unemployment. And so before we jump on the tax bandwagon, I would ask if you can think about different ways of getting to the same answer without putting the burden on just another group of people who maybe don't have as much of vocal representation. And, and I would also correct taxation on mileage is not a revenue source, it's a tax. You're basically taxing people for driving and that is not generating revenue. You're just taking money from someone for doing their job. And so Connor, I, marijuana I, is, a, is a revenue source. Yes, I could see that and online gambling can be a revenue source, but taxation on mileage is not a revenue source. That's just another way to tax. Council, I, I guess I just don't understand. You're, are you, you're saying that if we're not able to pass other legislation, if the economy doesn't continue to rebound, if uh, President Biden is somehow incapable of passing the stimulus plan that he's suggesting will pass in the next couple of weeks. If all of those things happen, you're then asking Representative Warren Bellow to, to cast her vote on a proposal that hasn't made it out of either the Finance Committee or the Appropriations Committee, because it seems like there are a lot of hypotheticals wrapped up there. But, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a budget process. So we got a first document from Governor Lamont. Uh, the finance and appropriations committees are starting their process. I'm on the appropriations committee. Uh, my colleagues are on the finance committee. We are holding hearings. We are going uh, into the weeds of looking at our expenditures, what we can afford, what our priorities are. Um, that's, that's the process. And I think it's a little premature to say, hey, um, if we, uh, you know, if, ands, and buts, what would we vote on? We don't know yet. It's still a process. This is a situation none of us have been through dealing with the after effects uh, or the lasting ramifications of a global pandemic. So this is new ground for all of us and we're, we're trying to do the best job we can for weather. I, I don't think anyone's question about whether someone's doing the best job or not, but this isn't new ground. The, the, the standard protocol in the state of Connecticut is when you run out of revenue, just tax more. And what I'm trying to say is, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwash. Let's take a chance and say, okay, if we can't drive new revenue sources, why do we always resort to taxes as the way to correct and fix that? Connecticut right now has one of the strongest fiscal positions of any state in the country. So we have the largest rainy day fund in state history. Uh, we are doing better than any of our, just about any of our sister states, thanks to the fiscal stewardship of folks like Senator Fumpara, uh, who's been leading the charge of the finance committee to make sure that we're, uh, we're spending uh, what we have to, but not one penny more. And yeah, it's been tough for the last 20 years, uh, but we're right now, our, our bond rating has uh, gone up in the pandemic. And I don't think too many states can say that. No, and, and that's- and um, um, Councilman, I'm sorry to cut, to cut you off, but we on the Commerce Committee, we are doing things to increase revenue by reinvesting in Connecticut and making our businesses a priority and doing things like the Angel Investor Tax Credit Program for the biotech sector. This has actually moved the needle for growing biotech and being an incubator state. Um, for our manufacturing sector, 20 years ago, manufacturers came to the state and said, we are in a bind. You know, our industry is, you know, um, losing tons of people and being shipped overseas. And we partnered with the, ma the manufacturing sector to help buy really expensive equipment. We do a grant program. We do um, apprenticeship training. And these are great paying jobs and our manufacturers are happiest that they've ever been. So in terms of revenue, I do come from the side of, I don't wanna lead with a tax discussion. I don't wanna lead with how we balance the budget through taxes. I wanna lead with how are we um, balancing the budget by reinvesting in Connecticut and driving revenue into our general fund. And I, and I believe we can do that. And I think we have done a good job doing that. And one of the things that we're doing on insurance is growing a captive insurance in, um, industry. That moves the needle. That brings in more dollars to um, Connecticut. So I, in particular, 
with the rest of people up here, work on things that drive new revenue and look outside the box. I mean, I never want to lead a discussion here by saying, we're going to tax X, Y, and Z, because that doesn't make sense for me as someone that works with businesses every day. I want to say, Connecticut's open for business. This is a great place to bring your business and a great place to grow. And we do that in the Commerce Committee. And it's, it's great to see the stuff that comes, that comes out of there. Uh, and, and that I respect and, I, and I, I completely agree with that and understand what you're doing. It's just, I look at the end result and we always see tax increases. And that's to me what I measure. I look at my personal checkbook. I look at my banking account. I look at my paychecks and I notice every year I'm paying more and more in taxes and I'm seeing less and less in a return. And what I'm trying to say is, you know, there comes a time where, you know, you're saying manufacturing is thriving and doing great. And I'm seeing GE and UTC is basically non-existent in carriers in Florida. I'm not really seeing manufacturing doing great. And so what I'm saying is maybe we should start looking at it from a different perspective instead of saying, well, if we don't meet it, we'll just add more taxes. I've seen tons of recommendations for taxes. And that's why I was trying to get to the point is, can we get a commitment that, no, we're going to sit there and say enough is enough. We're not going to tax anymore. We're going to find other ways to generate the revenue, or maybe we're going to have to cut back on certain services. And I've never heard that from a politician in the state of Connecticut. It's always, well, you know what, if we run out of money, we'll just tax more. And that's what I'm trying to get. Well, I'm happy to share a press release that I sent out last week that says exactly that. So um, that is the model that I come from. I believe in our companies here in Connecticut. I believe in our companies here in Weathersfield. And I believe in generating revenue through making them, making this a healthy place to do business. I'll just jump in real quick and say, Dan, um, I don't think I have to remind anyone here that um, wasn't just but a few years ago that we had uh, two years of bipartisan budgets, Democrats and Republicans together that, that basically shut the governor out of the room and said, we're gonna do this together. And we did, and we did some great work together. And so if anybody feels like those two years were bad years, then I guess bipartisanship is a bad thing. I happen to think we did a great job during that period. Yeah, Democrats are in control now, but I, 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 I look. At our, our, are there folks who, who um, have a, a stronger opinion on 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 who should pay taxes versus others? Yep, but I don't know of anybody who says who wakes up in the morning saying, "I'm going to go find a way to raise taxes." I don't know of anybody. Even the most progressive folks in my caucus, I don't feel. I, I know they don't wake up thinking that way. They may feel like our tax structure is out of balance and who pays and who doesn't. But uh, I don't know of anyone who starts off Democrat or Republican thinking that uh, I'm gonna, I want to vote to raise taxes today. Certainly not, not anybody in the Weathersfield delegation uh, by any means. And, and my comments were never to insinuate that, that you're going in there saying, let's vote taxes. I'm, I'm just saying you hear about all these great things going on and then we see a tax rate at the end and whether it's bipartisan or not, that doesn't, my attitude is going shame on the Republicans for going along with that. Because my attitude is I just think Connecticut has seen enough of tax increases that it would be nice if we could suddenly have a tax decrease or have it. I don't, I don't know what you're referring to, which tax you're, you're referring to. I've chaired the, the finance committee now for, this is my ninth year, I believe. I don't know what tax you're referring to when you say that, but I'll tell you, here's what the reality is. Connecticut, for every dollar we raise in revenue, 53% of that goes to unfunded liabilities. 53 cents of every dollar goes right out the window, not out the window, it goes to pay back for, for obligations that the state did not meet for about 40 years. And so we're all in this folks. We're all in this together to get out of that. We're trying our best. We've rebalanced some of our obligations. Our, our budget reserve fund, which is at $3 billion for the first time made a deposit into reducing that obligation. Of, uh, I forget how many millions of dollars, it, I think $16 million. The point is, is that we are doing things. What we need to do, Dan, what we need to do, and, and Representative Wood uh, mentioned this, is grow our economy. 
Our, our economy is on its knees. We fail to retain and attract young people because we don't want to invest in those things that young people want. That's why GE left the shadow of its, the self, of its old self, but it went to Boston because of talent, not because of taxes. They went to a higher tax environment. They went because of talent. And so did uh, Aetna until CVS bought them. And, and believe it or not, that's why we now have Raytheon uh, as opposed to United Technologies. It's talent. And, until, and think about it. You know how much this, the property tax raises every year in Connecticut? $10 billion, more than the income tax in some years. It is the largest consistent revenue raiser in the state, $10 billion. And yet we let that talent that we, about 80% of those, that 10 billion goes to education. We educate better than anywhere else in the country. And we let many of those young people leave the state because we won't invest in our state for the things that young people want to stay here and do and, and, and come here from other states to do. And until we figure that out, until we're willing to do that, we're gonna to continue to lose our talent to other places. We educate them, you pay taxes, you educate them, and then we say to kids, let's go. We have the best, the brightest come to Yale and UConn and other schools in this state. And after four years, we say, well, good luck with whatever you wanna do somewhere else. It's a, it, it, it is, on our, it's our obligation to change that. And we're, we haven't had the will to do it yet, not in any significant way. And one of the biggest things that we hear on the Commerce Committee in terms of attracting talent to the state is a lack of um, high-speed rail or other mass tra transportation. It is a driving factor for people moving here. And when you think of people coming here for a job, you actually have to provide for two jobs because it is usually a couple. Um, that are looking for two jobs. And right now in Connecticut, we can provide one, but we're really, um, it's hard for us to provide the two jobs. So these are the things that we explore and try to work on and try to improve, um, you know, in the, le in the legislature through policy choices. I, I appreciate that. And John, I think, you know, I, I speak very highly of you and I appreciate your comments. Um, I would give one final recommendation is if we're looking for new revenue sources, maybe we should take a look at the Yale Endowment Fund and see if there's a way we can actually tax that, which could solve a heck of a lot of problems in the state of Connecticut. $41 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Agreed. Anybody else with any comments or questions for our delegation members. No. Oh, Councilwoman Peltier. I'm sorry, you thought you were about to leave. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I just have uh, two quick things. I wanted to circle back to the car break-ins because it was mentioned briefly. Um, and I know that um, some of you have put forth some bills. Some of them are, you know, have some good um, ideas in them, and I appreciate um, you guys working toward finding a, some solutions to the problem. Um, and I know that a lot of your colleagues have also put bills in, and there's so much floating around, and it's it's in the Judiciary Committee or wherever, where, and who knows how it'll come out. But um, I, I do hope that um, we will consider supporting some of the stronger penalties for um, the juveniles and making it a little bit easier for detain orders to be issued because um, for repeat offenders in particular, and um, because I think that is one of the biggest problems is the repeat offenders. And one more, I had a question for representative Wood. Um, I, I noticed that uh, you have proposed a bill that uh, to create a task force to study the health benefits of magic mushrooms and it's, that's sort of uh, perceived to be the first step towards legalization. And I was just curious what the impetus was for um, you, um, you know, sponsoring this legislation and whether the ultimate goal is legalization for recreational purposes. Uh, well, I'm not opposed to um, legalization for recreational purposes, but the impetus for me co-sponsoring was, um, I was on the Veterans Committee um, my first term and we heard a lot of testimony on how 
psilocybin, which is the um, ingredient in mushrooms, was um, doing really incredible work on PTSD victims. And um, I just, I'm just have a soft spot for veterans. I do a lot of work in the community with veterans and um, it really had changed their lives for the better. So uh, if anything we can do to help, and I know it doesn't, you know, affect just veterans. I mean, it affects, you know, all different kinds of victims with PTSD, but um, for people that had no options and no hope, uh, this was a game changer. So um, I think we should study it, you know, if it's gonna change someone's life for the better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'll just touch on some of the points that were made. I, I mean, I don't want to belabor anything. And, you know, we're into the second hour here. But um, with regard to the car break-ins, uh, I do appreciate uh, our delegation looking into that. I, I know it's not just a Weathersfield um, in our surrounding towns issue. I, I'm sure all 187 legislators are, are asking, you know, for something to be done for their municipalities and their districts. Uh, but I would like to echo some of the, the um, comments that uh, Councilwoman Peltier had made about the task force and you know some of the pieces of legislation. I, I forget it may be Senator Lesser and uh, Representative Morin Bellows le legislation that has the uh, regional task force, uh, and I think Representative Wood, you you touched on it in the past as well bringing the uh, chiefs of police and the police departments together uh, to kind of work in hand to, um, you know, because this is, this is something that even though it comes from the, the legislature down in, in handling the, uh, the laws and the penalties, um, you know, you could get some good advice from our, um, you know, boots on the ground with our uh, police departments, as well as, you know, local councilmen. Uh, and women from the, the various municipalities that you represent. So if there is, talk about creating any type of a uh, regional task force, please, you know, reach out to those of us on this uh, uh, Zoom tonight, as well as our police department and, um, you know, seek the advice and counsel of them um, and share that with your colleagues. Uh, I know it's a, a difficult session trying to cram, you know, 3000 bills into just a handful uh, every year is, is difficult especially given you know, the magnitude of uh, the number of proposals that are out there this year and uh, working remotely. But that is definitely a priority for us uh, as well. Um, just talking a little bit about the, the two years that the, the Senate was uh, split 1818, Senator Fonfara. Uh, yes, a number of good app, um, you know, proposals had come out and um, laws were adopted. I think the volatility cap as well as the bonding cap and some other um, um, more serious uh, constraints on, on spending had come out of that. And uh, you know, I, I think that is the impetus for our um, um, rainy day fund being flush with uh, um, revenue right now. And I would just uh, you know, echo some of the, the concerns that were made uh, earlier about um, increased taxes on, on residents. If, uh, um, if we do use the federal relief funds, um, don't pay for any ongoing expenses with them. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it, it just creates a, a bigger hole for um, you know, revenue to have to backfill in the out years. So, um, you know, that's, that's just that. And I think that's uh, education funding is coming as well in the, the most recent stimulus package that was signed. Um, as we get education funds into the municipalities, uh, we just wanna make sure that it is not spent um, on ongoing expenses that we can utilize it now uh, for some of the, you know, fill in some of the holes that have been created because of remote learning and, and um, what the students are missing out right now um, supplement rather than supplant uh, funds for uh, for us. So, um, and I also support Representative Woods' uh, comments about the uh, Commerce Committee. Uh, that is one of the, the better committees. Uh, you know, the proposals in the the pat, uh, adopted legislation out of the Commerce Committee has definitely helped um, to grow our economy. We were reaping some of the benefits that have uh, come out of that committee in the past couple of years. Um, but we can't, uh, you know, 
revert back to some of the the, the job killing proposals that uh, have been brought up in the past. And uh, you know, if we can kind of keep those at bay, uh, it would definitely help our economy, um, not only here in Weathersfield, but for the state that we rely so much on. So, anybody else? Any questions? Representative Wood. Oh, sorry. Thank you uh, for having us, Mayor. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I know uh, tomorrow, I think uh, you guys are in session, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow. No? Okay. Just, uh, I did see the, the list of public uh, hearings on Thursday it goes uh, about a mile long. And uh, I know appropriations is meeting on uh, Friday night too. So um, you guys will have your hands full with uh, a number of public hearings coming up in the next couple of weeks. So. Mike, if I could just say uh, in that regard, you know, just like your meetings are, are all Zoom, so are ours. And it really provides, it's difficult for us because we're, we prefer to be together and, and have conversations. A lot of work gets done that way. But in terms of the public, everyone has access to uh, a hearing now. And, and as I said in the hearing today, you can speak from your home, from your business, from your car, on a cell phone. It doesn't matter. It is the most democratic process. And at least on the finance committee, we're doing it entirely by lottery. So um, you could be a first timer ever speaking and go first, depending. Matter of fact, uh, the Senate president wasn't happy where, his, where he fell in the lottery today. So uh, it is fully democratic. Um, I got a little heat for that, but in any event, uh, it is what it is. Yeah, and to that point, I just brought up the Public Health Committee public hearing, which is now on its uh, 11th hour, going on 12 hours. And I know they're, they're planning to go the full 24 hours. 702 people are watching the Public Health Committee. Uh, over 2,000 had signed up to testify on wow. that. Uh, I remember last year when the similar bill was up, there was about 5,000 folks in the uh, uh, Capitol for that public hearing day. So uh, yes, Senator Fonfair, definitely people are taking advantage of um, the ease of access to be able to testify. And uh, we actually appreciate everything that the legislature has done uh, to make the remote uh, legislating a little bit or virtual legislating uh, to be a, a little bit more easy, easier, user-friendly for uh, the, um, the public, so. You thank that. Anybody else with anything before I say good night and let you guys get ready for a busy week ahead? So, thank you all. We really appreciate you guys coming. Thank, thank you guys. You so much. much. Gary, did I see you? Yep, yeah, you're on. Okay, Let's see, we've got some callers in the queue. I'll just move down to um, item A. Uh, we don't have any hearings. We just heard from the delegation. Um, A2, general comments. Um, do we have anybody from the public on tonight? Yes, Mr. Town Manager? Yes, we do, Mayor. Uh, First one is 860-257-3543. Uh, please remember to state your name and address for the record. Uh, press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have five minutes. Hi, um, it's Mary Breton, 209 Clovercrest Road. Can you hear Hi, me? Mary. Yep, Hi. we can hear uh, Good evening, Mayor and Town Council. Thank you for your service and thank you for celebrating Black History Month. You affirmed our town's commitment to honor black history and culture, to celebrate often neglected achievements, to battle racism, foster inclusivity and respect, and celebrate our diverse culture. If I may, in honor of Black History Month, I'd like to share the accomplishments of two of our residents. The first I learned of in a Facebook post from the Wethersfield Historical Society, Lemuel Custis lived on Knott Street he was one of the first five men to train as part of the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. He flew 92 combat missions and received the Distinguished Flying Cross for heroism. But when he returned to America, there was little fanfare. 
it would be decades before the Tuskegee Airmen were acknowledged or even widely known. A black airman who followed in his footsteps said, he paved the way for us. He made it easier for all of us who, come, who came later and wanted to fly. The second accomplishment is a recent one. Councilor Ryan Biggs is the first black town councilor in Wethersfield, Connecticut's oldest town. He has an MBA, he's a Navy reserve officer, husband and father of two young sons. He hopes that he can be an example to his sons and to other youth so that they can say they'd like to be like him. Black History Month celebrates the stories of our past leaders, raising awareness of those who are overlooked and of the current leaders, right in our midst, leaders who pave the way for others. But at the last town council meeting, a resident came up for public comment. He said instead of Black History Month, that we should have a month to honor hardworking taxpayers who are overlooked, underrated, and under duress. Black History Month also raises awareness so we can recognize when Black history is being marginalized. The residents' remarks are an example of false equivalence that instead of recognizing black history overlooked for many years due to oppression and ongoing discrimination, that we should instead recognize taxpayers who are under duress when they pay taxes for property they own and for the services they receive. While, many, while a few may struggle to pay taxes, it does mean you have property. And 400 years ago, black slaves could not even own it. That's duress. And in today's America, for black people, duress continues. We see white supremacists emboldened by our former leader. We see systemic racism, discrimination, and voter suppression, and we see marginalization. In Wethersfield, it's great that we have a proclamation honoring black history that celebrates these overlooked accomplishments that shaped our nation, but it was immediately, it was immediately met with a public comment that insults its value. Think about what it feels like as a black person to hear remarks like this in a public comment. And to our black residents, unchallenged damaging remarks like this, well, they build up like a deep weight that crushes the spirit of black people of this town. And then sadly, it becomes an indicator as to how we value our black residents. We value first amendment rights and we should, no matter how offensive, insulting or harmful the comments are, aside from swear words, residents and certainly this resident can say anything he wants to. And so can I, and that's why I'm speaking tonight and town council, so can you. You are leaders of our community. Please respond, show how we value our black residents. A simple response would mean a lot, something like, we believe Black History Month is important. Far too long historical achievements of black people have been overlooked. That's why we raise awareness and learn. It strengthens our community. As for taxpayers, you all receive town services and we do welcome ideas on how to reduce taxes, but with regard to Black History Month, we still have much work ahead. To start, we must treat each other with respect and we don't mar marginalize the importance of celebrating our black history and culture. A response is important because it reflects upon our community. Our local communities then set the moral, ethical and social fabric for our nation. At Lemuel Custis's funeral in 2006, his friend said he loved this country even when it didn't treat him the way it should have. And he showed anyone who thought otherwise that it is the medal of the man not the color of his skin that counts. So please don't forego this opportunity to respond and to show who we are as a town. Give the, pro the proclamation life, raise awareness, do this for our town and in particular, and especially for our black residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Very well said, appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, next caller, 860-402-8087. Please state your name and address for the record. You'll have five minutes and press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Shannon Roach calling in, uh, 104 Surrey Drive. I was calling in uh, because I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling flustered. Um, and I know that when I feel that way, that it comes across um, as I'm angry. And I need people to understand that it's, it's not about anger. 
You know, civil rights activist Audre Lorde once said, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. So I'm speaking today because I am irritated with the fact that there are residents that can call in and make very offensive comments uh, to the minorities in this town and nothing is said about it. It is not addressed publicly because we say that we allow residents to speak. But yet I was censored when I called in and swore on this line a few months ago because it was said to have been against the, the violation of YouTube, I guess. But I, I didn't, finding it very hard to understand how it is more offensive to swear than to spew hatred and racism and how we can sit and not address those things when it is very evident in our faces every single day. I understand that the person that does it has been doing this for years and it is just second nature just to tune it out. But when you tune it out and you allow it to be said, whether you are saying it or not, you are accepting of it. And you are telling this resident and other residents that it is okay and it is not okay. If what I said was offensive to you, to other viewers and to your children, then I ask you, how is racism not offensive to me, minority viewers and the listening ears of my children? If I called in and I spewed racism that was offensive to you or your children, I am quite sure that it would be addressed. So I am asking each one of you to do the right thing and stop allowing offensive behaviors to happen in our community. I understand that you cannot change the way somebody feels, but you can change the way you react. And that is going to go a lot further in our community than not saying anything at all. And before I get off, one other thing, Audrey Lord also once said, it is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. So I'm asking for you guys to have perspective on differences, recognize, accept them, and let's celebrate our differences together to grow our town and make this a better place for everybody included. So I want to thank each one of you for listening to what I said, and I am hoping to connect with each one of you very soon so that we can make this a better place for every single one of us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you for calling in and, and expressing those comments. Uh, very much appreciated. Okay, next caller is 860-563-6923. Again, please state your name and address for the record. You'll have five minutes to speak and press star six to unmute yourself. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. First of all, Mayor, I'm, I'm frustrated too, angry also. As a taxpayer in this town, I, I, I continue to pay my taxes. I am overlooked. I'm underappreciated. And I'm ignored as well, except for you guys. You talk to me. Or you let me talk anyway. And I really believe we, the, the taxpayers should be honored in some way. We support this town. And, 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 and you really don't give us much reason there to continue to support, support this town. You know, tonight I, I turned on uh, this presentation, your, your town council meeting. I, I didn't have, I, did, I wasn't aware we were going to have our state delegation here tonight. Uh, but I, you know, I sat and I listened. And I have a few comments, and I wish they were here, but they're just like the MDC. 
when they get done with their talk, they pack up and leave. But you know, one of the, th the big issue here is for the state of Connecticut, it does not provide any reason for us citizens to even stay here. I mean, you, you suck us blind. You, you just take the blood right out of us with your taxes. And I'm, and I'm really talking to the people that just left, the four of them. When I look at my, my electric bill and I see all those taxes hooked up to it, it's just taking it right out of my veins, the taxes. When I look at my water bill, I look at my, my telephone bill, look at my driver's license and my fees that I have to pay for driving on the highway that now I barely even go on the highway because of the pandemic. Go buy an automobile and pay that kind of tax that we have to pay. On a, I, and, and, and now I understand our great friends that just left us also gave us a tax when we trade in our automobile where we have to pay an extra so many hundred, or the dealer has to pay so many hundreds of dollars when we trade in our automobile with them. And of course they tack it onto our bill. I argue with my, ta my automobile dealer. I tell him he's a coward. To st he doesn't even stand up to the state of Connecticut. He just accepts and then he turns and he ex expects us to pay all these taxes that are connected with the purchase of an automobile or the repairs of the automobile or whatever else. I, I honestly don't understand how you folks and those folks that were in front of us a few minutes ago can continue to talk about how great of a state we have here. I think it's horrible. I mean, do you know that state taxes that they collect for so many things that is, I can't believe it. I can't believe what they collect. And then I watch how they spend. I see how the money just goes out the door. You know, tonight somebody said, oh, 53% of, of our revenue is, is got to be paid back for liabilities. What does that mean? Does that mean all the mortgages or all the bonds, all, 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 all the unfunded this and all the unfunded that that we currently have with the state of Connecticut represents 53% of all the revenue that comes in? And on top of it, Mr. Fonfara, he, he, he's not happy with the governor because he wants more bonding. The governor wants to hold back on bonding. Well, that's one of our liabilities that we have in this state. We live so far beyond our, our means. We have to con the state has to continue taxing and taxing and taxing. Hear what Ms. Bellow said when somebody asked her if she was going to raise taxes. Boy, was she squirming to give an answer. But we all knew she would raise taxes. We know darn well she'll raise taxes. She did that right here in Wethersfield. I could quote to you, and I'm not prepared with the dollars to, to tell you what they were. I'll tell you next week. At the next meeting, I'll tell you what, what, they had, what, what she increased our tax bills on. And then we... We, we just continue to have more and more tax issues that there, there, there's no turning around because of the poor management. And then we have the town of Wethersfield, Mayor. Mr. Young. I noticed tonight on your agenda, we're at, uh, you're, about five you're talking minutes. about uh, selling, was it 15 acres of land down in the meadows that's nothing else but swamp land for $30,000. That's a good price. Mr. Mayor. Young. That's a good Price that's eighteen nineteen hundred dollars an acre, but what Mr. did Young, the town if we can, of Weathersfield uh, wrap this up? There's a for that for that public hearing swampland up at the Keisha the, farm. You paid seventy five thousand dollars for every acre, which included thirty two acres in total. Five six acres of that was wetlands. We'll and be having a conversation later. Seventy five thousand dollars for it, and tonight. You got an offer on your table to buy 15 acres for $30,000. And we'll be discussing and that. That's shortly. just why our government is so bad. You got it? You got to do something, guys. You got to straighten things out.
Thank you, Mr. Young. So anyway, anyway, Please. I, you know, we, we we can talk all night, and I have. Well, talked we have all a night public hearing option at the end of the meeting. You can continue then. Oh, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Eight six zero, eight three eight one four five three. If you could state your name and address for the record, you'll have five minutes to speak. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Good night, everyone. This is Paul Brady from 1618 Church Street. Um, well, first of all, let me just say thanks to everyone that's on the board for your attempt to actually celebrate Black history in the town of Wethersfield. However, I, like most residents, were deeply disturbed after hearing the comments of one resident, which I won't even give credence to his name by mentioning it, to say that the taxpayers need to be celebrated in the town of Wethersfield rather than Black History Month. As a Black male, all types of things ran through my head. I thought to myself, what happened if my son was listening to this? We keep on hearing in this town the deep racism that runs here. And it's, it's by no means, and I'll tell you, by no means it makes any, anyone in this town that's a Black person feel good. Okay, there are people that are leaving the town of Wethersfield that are, that are black folks, that are minorities, because they have decided that they're fed up. As one person told me in Hartford, I don't even know why you bothered to buy a house in Wethersfield to go fight with those, with those racist white folks in Wethersfield. I mean, in this country in the 21st century, you would think that people would get over themselves. The reality is black folks, whether you like it or not, help to build this country. We have done so much for this country. I've had countless family members that have bled, that have died serving this country. To listen to one person of this, of this town to say something like that a public forum, and not one person that's sitting there to even say, you know what, we're going to censor you, or these comments aren't welcome here. I think this is my fourth or third time using this quote from Thomas Jefferson, one man with courage is a majority. And that, that's all it takes. Don't only do things when you're, when the camera is on you and the lights are on and your constituents could see you, but also when no one's watching. Always do things as if no one's watching. And we really need leaders in this day and age. We need leaders. We don't need politicians. We need leaders. Don't go power into your base because they want to hear certain things, do things because they're right. Because you wanna leave a better legacy for your, your children. And that people could say, you know, no matter what, what side of the aisle you were on, that you had integrity. Don't, don't, do, don't, don't condone these type of things. It is absolutely wrong. Racism is wrong. Black folks have done so much for this country. And I know in this country, we like to divide everything up and say, oh, well, um, you know, some people are Latino, some people are this, some people are that. At the end of the day, it blacks in many shades. And if you really want to get technical, black folks were here before white folks. And slavery built America. We've, we've given so much to this country. And I think it's about time. It's about time for a little bit of recognition. If it's even to say on Black History Day, to, to say, you know, thank Black folks for their, for, the, for, the, 
for the sacrifices that they have made in this country. That's all. That is it. We're not asking you, we're not asking you to reverse time and to do anything like that. So I think that is, that is not too much to ask for. But again, I would thank you for attempting to celebrate Black history in the town of Wethersfield. I, great, I, I truly greatly appreciate it. But I wish and I hope that for the next time that anyone else comes on town council meeting and public hearing to spew racism and hate, that members will say, no, no, this is not acceptable. Not here. Not here. So thank you all for your time and have a good night. Thank you, Paul. Is there anybody else? Just double checking. I believe we got them all in there. There are no more callers at this time for this component. Okay. Thank you. And we do have public comment at the end as well. Um, Council reports. Councilman Biggs. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Just trying to pull up the communications I've had. So um, let's see, for the uh, Weathersfield Historical Society, um, our last meeting um, was before the last council meeting, but they had some updates since then. Um, they want everyone to make sure they get out uh, in Old Weathersfield while they're walking and whatnot. They do have a new small Valentine's ex exhibit in their front windows at the Akini Center. Um, so they want you all to check that out. That'll be up for a few more days. Um, and they also have a display for Black History Month as well. Um, and it will also be on their social media pages. And their latest issue of their newsletter is in the mail now. And you should all, whoever is signed up, should be receiving that soon. Um, and that is for now. That is all that I have for you. Okay. Thanks, Councilman. Uh, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Yes, uh, Capital Improvement Advisory Committee met uh, last Wednesday. Um, they have managed to whittle down the long list of requests to just under $900,000 with an additional 100,000 being earmarked if additional funds are available. Uh, the only uh, thing left to do is to prioritize the uh, allocations that they selected in the event that uh, we have to reduce the amount of uh, appropriations. That meeting will take place tomorrow evening. And I think uh, shortly after that, they will present to the council that are uh, listing of uh, suggested items. Okay. No. Thank you. Anybody, uh, Councilwoman Pelletier. Thanks. Um, I attended the Housing Authorities meeting last week and I just wanted to highlight a few um, programs that some of the residents have been able to take advantage of. Um, these are programs that are available to any qualifying renters in town, and it's sort of relevant to landlords as well. Um, so the federal moratorium on evictions was extended through the end of March, and the state moratorium on evictions was extended um, through April 20th. And it sounds redundant, but there's actually different eligibility requirements. So if you don't qualify for one, you may qualify for the other. Um, but the eviction moratoriums don't prevent rental arrears from accruing. So obviously, you know, we want to encourage everyone who can pay rent to do so. Um, the state also has had a temporary rental housing assistance program um, to help um, renters who have been financially impacted by the pandemic to um, help them pay their rents. The program has expired, but the State Department of Housing is um, getting ready to roll out another similar program that should be able to enroll applicants by the end of the month. Um, and this is you know, good for renters and landlords to be aware of, um, especially during the eviction moratorium to help people pay their rents. 
Um, and finally, one last thing the I had mentioned a few months ago that the Housing Authority would be requesting that the council uh, apply for a community development block grant on its behalf. They've actually decided to postpone their um, application till next spring. So I just wanted to let you know not to expect that. And that's all from the Housing Authority. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Mr. Town Manager, did you get that about the block grant application? I know you had been talking about that. Yep. Thank you for that update. Um, yeah, the TRAP program for uh, renters and landlords. Um, I think, yeah, they, the state is eligible for, I think, $236 million from the federal government for that. And uh, we'll be getting into the hands of uh, um, both renters and, or both tenants and, um, and landlords um, to help um, that situation out. So I appreciate that, Councilwoman. Anybody else with council or um, uh, commission reports? Okay, uh, council comments. Councilman Hill. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to kind of thank some of the uh, folks that came up and spoke tonight. Um, Ms. Bretton, Mr. Brady, in particular, Mr. Roach, you know, he, he's absolutely right. You know, it is not okay. Um, and I do just want to quickly say I appreciate them bringing all of that um, to the council's attention. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Any other council comments? Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I, you know, I was not, uh, I couldn't attend last meeting, obviously, well, I talked to Mike beforehand, the mayor before, uh, because of the snowstorm. Uh, but in this, in this hearing, and then uh, the meeting from two times ago, there has been an, an uncomfortable tone as it sort of relates to the Black History Month, the responses, um, some sort of might intimate some dog whistles kind of a comments like, uh, and, and it's not, it's not right. There is sort of an under an undertone of of disrespect, and uh, I'm not necessarily comfortable with it. Of course, we're going to protect people's right under the First Amendment to whether it's speech I like or speech I don't like. But if it's if it's a speech that's going to divide us rather than unite us, I'm um, I am uncomfortable with that, and uh, I don't think it's our way forward. But I also do respect the fact that as a proclamation. And, and the very steps this council has taken and, and the people in general, um, that we are, we are certainly working to understand each other and be an inclusive, inclusive neighborhood. And that certainly I'm sure all of our towns have some individuals which are probably just flat out racist and, and probably a lot of other ists. But uh, generally speaking, I think we're a good people, but we're definitely not perfect and we're trying to form a more perfect union. I appreciate that. Councilman, anybody else with any comment? Uh, Councilman O'Connor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, I just have a question and maybe this would be directed towards the town manager. Um, it has always been my understanding that we are not allowed as a body to comment to public speakers and engage in conversations with them. And that is the premise I had gone on because it's very hard to argue with the speakers calling in. And I think it's pretty obvious I'm one who tends not to shut his mouth and probably opens it too many times. And the problem is I would love to have said something, but I believe we are prohibited from doing that. And I think that was one of the reasons nobody said anything. And perhaps the town manager can clarify the, if it's the Roberts rules, the laws um, on that process, because I do think the public needs to know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that uh, question, Councilor O'Connor. It is in fact uh, a Roberts rule that this council has historically fallen, uh, followed, not fallen. Um, so it is, uh, again, it's, it's part of Roberts rules. Uh, it's an opportunity for the public to comment and for the public to speak not necessarily for the council to engage. Um, and, it, and it helps to avoid engagement in a back and forth. And the, the difficulty that you have is if you, you as a body can decide 
whether or not you wish to follow that rule or continue to follow that rule. Um, I just caution you that once you break it, uh, then it may become the norm. Um, and so you have to use that very gingerly to, to decide whether or not you want to uh, move away from that policy. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I have a little bit of perspective. Uh, prior to sitting on council, I was a, I would say, active public speaker. I attended most meetings and always seemed to have something to say. And uh, on that side, it was very frustrating not to be able to have a conversation with council not to get any feedback other than uh, maybe interpreting or misinterpreting a facial expression. Now I'm on the other side of the fence and it's equally as frustrating to sit here uh, to listen to comments that I may or may not agree with on all subject matter, not just Black History Month or some of the comments that we've heard recently. Um, so I think, you know, everybody has to understand what, what uh, Councilor O'Connor just brought up. Our, our job here is to sit and listen and not to comment whether we feel we should or not. So that doesn't mean that I'm a racist person because I didn't make a comment after uh, one of the public speakers. I just wanted to try and clarify that. And I would like to say that, you know, that when the public does speak that, um, you know, we should probably respect the comments that we are, you know, not us as a body, I'm talking about the, the public when they're on uh, and, and testifying that they, they be respectful and that they, um, you know, have comments that are inclusive and not divisive. Um, you know, that has not always been the case. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to just reiterate that you know, when you are uh, speaking uh, up here, you are, you know, you're talking as a, as a singular person to a body that is larger than the nine of us on the council. You know, you are talking to your neighbors, um, to your friends, to your relatives, and, um, you know, be respectful for, for the comments that you put forth on the public record. Um, this is a, uh, this is a forum that, you uh, should and will continue to be all inclusive. And uh, if I can be of any help for anybody to um, get that point further across to them, um, I will gladly do so. And uh, we just have to be mindful of that when we are speaking or the public is speaking, um, that you are speaking as one, but you are speaking to many. So thank you. You know, Mayor, if I, if I just may, I just want to say thank you for saying that because it, it's a reminder to a lot of the folks that come up here that it is a two-way street. Um, you do have the right to come up and, and speak, but please be respectful to not only the council, but to the rest of the residents in town and we'll be respectful and listen uh, likewise. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councilman. Any other comments? Okay. Um, I, I don't want to step on the town manager's toes, so I'm, I'm going to keep my comments brief. Um, I did just want to talk about a couple things that are going on. Um, I had heard, you know, I think it was with the delegation, somebody had mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we're starting to see the corner uh, with the pandemic. And uh, it is, um, in fact, uh, we are seeing the numbers uh, statewide drop um, from a high of nearly 10%. Uh, positivity rate just around the holidays to now uh, in the high to low uh, 3%. Um, it's indicative of uh, the cautiousness that the, the residents are uh, abiding by. Um, obviously, we've heard it. We all have it ingrained in our heads about social distancing and um, mask wearing in public and keeping your footprint down. Uh, but the good news of the vaccination rollout has been uh, working well. Um, obviously, it can work a little bit better. And uh, actually, the town manager and I are having conversations about the possibility of a, a vaccine site here in uh, Weathersfield more than, um, you know, Walmart down at the 
the town hill or town line or um, CVS or Walgreens. Um, so those are going to be some discussions that we're having. Uh, but vaccinations now have uh, gone beyond the 75 and older. The 65 and older are, are starting now. And, uh, you know, for those maybe younger than me on this council, that's the baby boomer generation. So that is a very large swath of our public. And, um, you know, if they can get that rolled out uh, in the next two or three weeks, uh, we'll also start to see more of our first responders. Uh, I believe the CDC is recommending that teachers be included in the next phase of the vaccine rollout, um, which is good. And that will again start in about two or three weeks. So we should start to see that in the, the beginning of March. Um, but then we'll progressively get uh, more and more people vaccinated and hopefully get the, uh, the numbers to go down to a level where we are more comfortable with. Um, the governor's press uh, statement uh, came out just shortly before this uh, council meeting. I have not uh, had a chance to read it just yet, but I believe um, you know, he's going to start rolling back some of his restrictions uh, in the coming weeks, um, which is, uh, it's good news and it's bad news. It's, it's good news that you know, the restrictions are gonna be lessened, but it's, um, you know, we have to be mindful of uh, um, any increase that uh, will come about of it. So um, you know, take that as you will as we, we begin to open up um, businesses and, and allow more gatherings um, because if it does not work out, we don't want to get back into, you know, a phase one or a phase two where we were in the past. Um, with that also, uh, there was some confusion. I don't know if um, it had uh, made it to the public, but um, there were some discrepancies in numbers that were reported for cases here in Wethersfield. Um, our, our numbers were uh, above the um, uh, percentage out of 100,000 population above and beyond our neighboring towns. And um, you know, it was brought to my attention and uh, we reached out to C uh, CCHD or Central Connecticut Health District. And uh, they were actually working with the Department of Public Health to factor in some numbers that were skewing our uh, positivity rate. Uh, that number has been brought down over the last two weeks. We had seen, I think, 44 and 46 cases. So a combined roughly 90 cases um, that were erroneously uh, reported. So the numbers are more in tune with uh, what our neighboring towns are seeing. And um, as DPH continues to work on those numbers, we should see it level off to a, a, a number that uh, is truly reflective of Wethersfield residents. Um, uh, I'm happy to report there are some other activities going on in town. Um, thank you, uh, Councilman Forrest, uh, Councilman Biggs, uh, and um, uh, former uh, Councilwoman and now State Representative Amy Bello for coming to um, Keller Williams cut, uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. They are at, on the first floor of the Borden building on the Silestine Highway. Uh, it's great to have a, a real estate company come to um, town because you know it means that uh, you know, people are looking to move here into Weathersfield. Uh, housing stock is, um, is available and they are ready and willing and able to sell Weathersfield to people to come in. Um, it's a great time. Um, you know, I'm not a real estate guy, but I would imagine it's a, um, a, a seller's market right now for, for people uh, looking to, um, to sell their homes or to, to buy with the interest rates being so low. So well, we would do welcome Keller Williams coming here into town and uh, we look forward to them, you know, serving our residents uh, at the board. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Town Manager for his comments. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you to the council. Uh, and I'll piggyback actually off of some of the things that you said, but just for the council and residents knowledge, uh, budget season for us is now in full swing. Uh, we're having internal discussions uh, departments are working uh, both individually and then with myself and Mike O'Neill to kind of form uh, what will be presented to you. Right now, we're looking at revenue estimates and non-personnel related expenses, um, those costs that seem to be constantly moving on us. Finance, finance is also working to find cost savings or additional cost savings within health insurance, as well as other fringe benefits. 
um, just to try, try to keep those costs in check. As Deputy Mayor Mazzarella mentioned, the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee uh, has, is moving forward. We will hopefully host what is the last meeting tomorrow night to kind of um, affirm what we want to send to council. Our preliminary numbers from the governor's office, I know we heard from the delegation earlier, um, we seem to be flat funded from last year. I cannot anticipate where it's going to go from there. Uh, you heard what Sen Senator Fonfaro was talking about in terms of where those some of those revenues are coming from um, in order to create that budget. Uh, while flat funding is certainly better than a cut, at least from the governor's budget, at where we stand with the buzz, governor's budget, I'm hoping we actually see an increase uh, because our operating costs continue to rise, things, some within our control, mostly those without. Um, and so a flat funding basically could have a negative impact on us. Uh, just other, just in terms of how we operate, the governor may choose to extend his executive orders in terms of uh, how budgets, when budgets are due. I haven't heard any change, but as of now, I anticipate on meeting the charter established deadlines for delivery, uh, which would start with the first Monday in April being for the delivery of the budget to the council and to the residents, making that available to the public. Um, we're working on drafting the remainder of the budget and at which point I'll obviously circle back with the council to make sure of your availability for budget deliberations and budget hearings. Uh, a few positive notes for budget on the revenue side and Mayor, you actually gave me a nice lead into it. We have a very robust housing market going on right now. Sales over the last 12, 12 months are up 18%. We have more than 400 sales that we can categorize over the, that 12 month period where last year we were somewhere around three, 350, 360. Um, right now we're well over 400, we're about 425, 430. Um, but the average sales price is about 11% up over last year. Our numbers have actually returned to what the pre 2008 um, uh, sales prices were right before the market. Um, dropped or bubble burst, however you want to phrase it. We're, um, a lot of our tax revenue that we're seeing, some of that is driven by a number of the tax agreements that were put in place for some of these developments are now coming offline, or actually I should say the tax is being fully realized as they, they, uh, the taxation or the, the property comes fully online. And oddly enough, we had an increase in motor vehicle revenue of about $12.5 million. We actually saw a drop in the number of vehicles um, on the list. However, the value of the total vehicles, because a lot of the older vehicles were replaced with newer vehicles, um, bumped us up, as I said, 12 and a half million. So that's kind of a quick look at the revenue side. We seem to be trending um, on path or on track for um, building permits. Uh, and I think town clerk revenues might still be a little bit above where we're anticipated. So that's helping drive things forward. We're hoping with a continued strong spring market, we can bring in additional revenues. Uh, Mayor, as you alluded to, the state COVID numbers appear to be uh, dropping and moving in a downward flow. That includes not only statewide, but also within the town. We did remedy the, um, it looked like there were some fluctuations within ours that those numbers have been backed out. We are slightly over 2,300 total um, uh, positive uh, cases since March of uh, 2020. I've lost track, it's only been a year. Um, but the pace has seemed to slow and that's good news for us. Um, Central Connecticut Health District worked with emergency management team, which was led by Anthony Dignati and Karen Tomchik. Um, and they worked together with social and youth services staff to provide, we'll call it two vaccination events at the community center. The first was really just a trial. It was about 10 to 12, just to see how the flow would work and if we could handle how we would work to handle volume. Um, and the second was probably about 40 to 50 residents um, total. And again, the target was uh, age 75 and above, those at most at risk. Um, I wanna give a special recognition to Amy from Social and Senior Services, who really led a team of um, employees, both from Social and Senior Services and Parks and Rec helping along um, to call more than 700 residents who fall within that 75 and above uh, target class to try to schedule them for um, shots, for appointments um, with the system that we're working. 
So, and with that, it's important to remind the town that all our, although our numbers seem to be trending in the right direction, we continue to encourage residents to maintain social distancing and follow good hygiene practices. Um, you know, we're, we're just at the start of seeing those come down. We really wanna eradicate this all together. Some other good points just to mention over the last couple of weeks, planning department applied for a small Connecticut humanities grant to assist with uh, additional interpretive signage within, um, within town. These sites are focusing on Trinity Church and then certain sites where the Great Meadows Conservation Trust is located. Um, as a FYI, the Putnam Bridge Project, the state Putnam Bridge Project, which was kind of moving forward relatively aggressively, they've kind of put the brakes on a little bit. The state has been um, I'm hearing that it's probably going to be pushed off about a year, um, but I'll look to confirm that in the near future for you guys um, so we know where it stands. Um, planning staff is also participating in an equity project with a small handful of about four or five other communities across the state. This is tied into our sustain, wow, sustainable CTs program uh, that we were recently awarded a silver um, designation and we were, as I said, one or four or five communities in the state asked to participate. Since we are beginning the process of updating our affordable housing plan, this group is looking to focus on understanding our existing housing data, what it says, and trying to incorporate or look at it through an equity lens and sustainable energy um, so we can really make some strong determinations as to how to proceed with um, future housing developments within town. Since I mentioned sustainable energy, I also want to give uh, some credit to staff. We are working with Eversource. This is, uh, as the mayor mentioned, you know, he had, he had talked to me about this early on um, um, in his uh, term as mayor. And uh, we've had a number of different businesses approach us over the last years. And there, there's been different levels of incentives available. Um, and so we kind of cut through the red tape and went directly to Eversource. We've been working with them in their uh, sales force and their manager to, to really look at some energy cost savings opportunities within the town, within town buildings. Um, we're also working with, um, to look at understanding some of the alternative um, practices related to municipal solid waste. Um, there's been the state Department of Energy and Environmental Protection came out with a series of workshops to see what other um, towns, uh, states and countries are doing in terms of alternative waste options. Um, and we're working at potentially coming forward with a couple of proposals for council to look at or for council to consider at different levels. Um, just, it's gonna be some basic information just to get it out to you guys, to give us to some direction as to which way you wanna see us go. Um, but we are looking constantly for cost saving opportunities, ways to reduce um, not only the, the cost to the taxpayer, but also to address environmental concerns um, within the community. And I think that's about it for now. Great, thank you. Sue. Okay, well, as uh, both you and the town manager mentioned, uh, real estate sales are definitely uh, still going strong. And with those, we have a lot of refis. So we are um, working every day to also help the title searchers obtain the documents that they can't get. We have to um, you know, pull them, scan them, and email them. Um, and we're just, just very, very busy still. So that's a good thing. Great. Thank you. And I, I think I saw in either this most recent town manager's report or one prior to that, um, some of the figures that are coming in um, that your your office is uh, providing us. So um, you know, we do see that maybe at the next meeting, Sue, we can discuss those in a little greater detail. Um, you know what uh, the town clerk's office is seeing for revenue coming in, as well as you know licenses and permits and. Um, you know, where we are on track as a comparison to last year. Okay, very good. Great, thank you. Anybody else with any comments at all before we move on to, I don't think we have any ordinances, resolutions or appointments tonight. No unfinished business. Uh, I think we can go straight into item four uh, bids. Uh, we do have the disposition of the town property. Um, 
think we brought that to the town manager's attention last meeting and um, and we have some additional information about that, as well as uh, those who responded to the RFP that has been sent out. So, um, Mr. Town Manager, do you have any information on this uh, item for us? Uh, on the disposition of property? Yes. No, I, yep. So I'll give you the break out. Um, as you recall, uh, the council had authorized the um, had authorized me to put this out through an RFP um, through uh, Charter Section uh, 37-5, um, and we went through the process. There were two respondents um, related to this proposal. Uh, those are attached were attached as part of the um, packet, and at this time, based off of the response. Um, I'm looking to move to the next step. And I make a recommendation that we refer these to the appropriate commission um, for review, uh, which would be planning and zoning for an 824. And I believe the conservation commission uh, with an opportunity to review um, as well. Okay. Any comments about uh, this item? Councilman Forrest. Um, according to our packet, I'd like to move to refer the bid responses to the appropriate town commissions for review and to provide advice and counsel to the town council related to regulations. And I think it's appropriate to do so. Um, since we have the committee set up, we'll receive the advice of council and then we can act on it next meeting. Okay. Um, council. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I'm questioning the, the process. Uh, is that normal to submit multiple packets to the various commissions for review? When, wouldn't it be normal to select a um, winning bid, if you will, and then have that packet reviewed for appropriateness? Do you want me to, I can answer. Um, Mr. Town Manager. So in, uh, I can default to council as needed. Um, the way the ordinance is written within the charter, the council, uh, the way the ordinance is written is the council has the authority to make a determination if they want to, if how they want to handle this. So, um, you know, ultimately the choice can be yours. Uh, the referral is specifically for the review of whether or not it, um, the use of the property or the advice uh, meets the requirements stated in the appropriate plan. So in terms of 824, planning and zoning will refer, you know, they can give you a comment basically saying, uh, yes, these both meet the requirements of 824. Or Conservation Commission can say, yes, they both meet the requirements associated with our plan. Ultimately the authority to choose and you have the right to choose more than one, um, the right to choose is ultimately the council's decision. So the referral could be to pick one uh, to <coughs> and say, look, we're gonna designate, we believe this is the best. Um, doesn't, it, ultimately it's council's decision how you wanna proceed. If you wanna send them both, you can. If you wanna just choose one, you can do that as well. It seems to me that, you know, we're creating extra work for the PNZ and the conservation uh, committee. Uh, what if we were to have, have received 10, 10 proposals? We're gonna have both parties review 10 different proposals. I, I just don't see the reasoning behind that. Councilman Forrest. Sure, the, the Conservation Commission uh, holds uh, not only the insight, but also a list and they always review except for one time on council. I know that they didn't and they got into a larger discussion. They always review uh, whether there's an acquisition or, um, or the selling of uh, open space property in the town of Wethersfield. And they, um, <clears throat> they not only review it on a lot of criteria that they've determined to determine the best disposal or acquisition of such property and then they advise council accordingly. And yes, if there were 10 bidders, they're not necessarily reviewing the bid, they're advising council on pros and cons 
uh, of the land itself. And then it's going to be, of course, our decision to make that accordingly. If you were to prejudge or make a decision and then send it over to them, that would almost be considered in my, and, and I've seen it, it'd be a slap in the face. It would be like, why do you need our advice and counsel if you're just going to go do whatever you're going to do? Um, and so that's why we have the commission is to advise and counsel. So it would be, uh, uh, and, and it may be that uh, more bidding is they would advise more bidding or not more bidding, but really it's not so much the bidding. It's what is, uh, what are the pros and cons of, of the piece of land? And then we would make the, the decision from there. So it's very appropriate and it's been done as long as I've been here, except for one time. And that one time, um, you know, you got the reaction that you would expect, like, what is our purpose here if it's not to do what we're actually charged to do? Okay. Councilman Biggs, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, Mayor, I basically was going to say the same thing. I think these commissions are in place for that specific reason. <clears throat> we give them the information they do with it and they advise us. So I, I would like to second it um, just because I believe that's why these commissions are in place is so we can provide them this stuff. They can give us feedback and kind of give us their insight on it because that's what they're there for. I just want to clarify what I was saying. I'm not suggesting that we don't have a proposal reviewed. I'm just suggesting that we review one proposal for whether it's appropriate or not and have the conservation committee, for, for example, say, no, we shouldn't be selling a piece of land or yes, we should, but not which one. Okay. And I, I guess I got to, just for clarification, Matt, did you make the motion? Was your first comment a motion? I did make the motion that was listed under the B4A action required in my packet. Yes, I did make the motion. Yep. I'm not and sure so, who big second did, but that would be your discretion, Mayor. Yeah, I, I think I did hear a second from Councilman Biggs. <laughs> Councilman O'Connor? Yeah, I just would like to ask uh, Councilor Forrest if he would be opposed to um, basically directing this to, as the deputy mayor referred to, is I'm trying to understand why we can't just direct this to P, P Z, and C for an 824 and then to the Conservation Commission to ensure the use meets the requirements set forth in the associated town plans. And so we have a bid for 30,000. I don't see why we can't accept it and refer it over. And I just curious on, you know, I didn't quite understand your thought process on that and why that wouldn't be a, uh, something to move forward with. It just, to me, seems to make a lot of sense. So <clears throat> as, from a pragmatic point of view, of course, look, um, if you if you wanted to, you could. It seems to me to put the cart before the horse because you're gonna get advice and counsel on the land, uh, the criteria that they use to determine what how it benefits the town of Weathersfield or doesn't. And then from there, you can make an informed decision on the bid that you wanna accept and move it to an 824. If you're right now, if you were to say, ah, I just want to take this one bid or go to this particular person or sell the land at all, for example, like we, you could, one option is that you don't want to disperse the land. That is, that's on the table. You might have an option to say, I want to go re out to bid again. You, you could accept one of these bids, right? All these things are on the table, but you would want the advice and counsel of people that have been monitoring this stuff and understand the use of this land and the benefits of the town before you make that decision. So in my opinion, you'd be making the decision before you got the advice and counsel and you just be telling him doesn't matter here's here's a, here's what we think and you know you can tell us if you're wrong but as you know when you go down that path realistically what are they going to say you know instead of giving them a clean slate with an open mind you'd say here's what, what our mind is pretty much you know you you, you tell us if you want to go against us which would be the same thing if i was thinking about talking to the town manager here's here's our vote we're going to go in this way but Town manager, you tell us why we're wrong, right? That's, 
that's sort of, I don't think that's fair to the, to the process of the system and the people involved, but uh -huh. that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't look at it that way. I don't think I'm asking for someone to tell me why I'm wrong is I'm trying to be pragmatic using your verbiage there and I agree with it. And, but, you know, I, I, I'm not going to debate or argue it because that's not my point. I'm just saying is I just see it a little differently. I think we can be pragmatic. And the purpose of PZ and Z and this conservation commission is to provide guidance and everything. And I don't understand why we'd want to delay that any more than we have to, but. Okay. Any other comments on this? Okay. Hearing none, there is a motion on the floor and it's been seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye, Seth. Thank you. And thank you for the explanation, uh, Gary, and for the uh, clarity on this, uh, Councilman Forrest. Yeah. Now, um, just timing wise, I know PNZ and Inland Wetlands and Conservation Commission are meeting tomorrow. Would we be able to get this on the agenda for them for tomorrow night? Or would this um, have to be at the, the following meeting? Correct, yeah, planning and zoning will go to the, I forgot today's date. Uh, yeah, planning and zoning would go to the first meeting, their first meeting in March. And then conservation commission is in the middle of the month <clears throat> for March as well. So they'd both be in March. Okay. Thank you for that. And our next is, and I see Derek Greger is on for uh, the paving bid. We have the spring paving uh, program coming up. Um, for those of you who remember, we did this uh, last year um, as well as in the fall for the fall paving program. Um, I believe uh, Derek has some additional information for us uh, with this, these particular bids. Um, and I will open the floor up to Derek and have him explain some of the um, rationale for uh, the newer uh, costs associated with some of these bids. Derek. Hey, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. Um, I'm here tonight, as you mentioned, to uh, get a couple of approvals related to our paving program. Um, just briefly before I did that, I wanted to spend just a few minutes uh, showing you a little bit of what we've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, I had taken a look at seeing we just finished with 2020. I just wanted to take a look at where we were uh, right now with the paving program and how we've been uh, proceeding. So I was going to put a plan up that shows uh, shows roads that have been paved and, and some information. Uh, Gary, am I uh, okay to share the screen? Yep, you should be all set. Let me know if it doesn't work. Okay, everyone see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what you're seeing here is what we've paved since the year 2001. Um, it's broken up into two segments, 2001 to 2010 is shown in, in red. Um, what we've done more recently from 2011 to 2020 is shown in blue. Um, looking at some of the statistics uh, for the first decade, we had done approximately 35 and a half miles of road. Um, most of that, about 91% of that was mill and overlay with 9% being a reconstruction type of work. From 2011 to 2020, um, we did a similar amount of roads, uh, about 33 and a half miles, um, of which 86% was milling and overlay and about 14% was reconstruction. Um, both of those are approximately 32 to 34% of all the roads we have in town. We have about 102.5 miles of paved roadway that we maintain. Um, so it was just an interesting statistic. Uh, looking at this, uh, you would you can easily see we're doing about a third every 10 years. Um, the remaining roads we have and given the conditions they're in, I would anticipate it would probably take a little bit longer than 10 years to get through that last 10% just because the costs are going to be higher than some of the mill and overlay. Um, however, just in general, just to get a snapshot of where we are, um, you know, I think the town's been doing pretty well to to 
to stay on track here and be able to, you know, basically we should be able to circle through the entire program in, in a 30 to 40 year period. Um, that is longer than ideal, but still um, making progress. So this was just an FYI to, to put it out there. A manager suggested I show it to you. It was presented to the Paving Advisory Committee this week when they took a look at the roads we're proposing and approve them. So we thought we'd share that with you as well. So with that, I'll move over to um, the first item on the agenda, which was the uh, paving contract for Tilcon. Um, <clears throat> as you can see in the, uh, in the agenda item, we're looking to do a, a couple areas. Um, one neighborhood is uh, Bristol Street and Albert Ave area. This is, um, a particular location where the MDC has been in there doing utility work in recent years. They paved part of the, um, the area when they did some sewer work, maybe about five, six years ago. We held off on doing the rest of the roads because they had a water main project that they just finished last year. So the intent was once they had finished that work, we were gonna come in and do a reclamation project and, and finish paving the rest of the roads that um, did not get done a few years ago when they did some sewer work in the Southern portion of it. Uh, includes Goodwin Park Road, which is um, near Jordan Lane to the Hartford City Line. We are talking with the City of Hartford to see um, if we can coordinate some of the work so we can uh, we can get a little further north into Hartford. They we've done this before, where they'll fund a portion of the project and, and Town Weathersfield pays to the town line. Um, but we're talking with them about it. My understanding is they have some work planned, so we'll try and coordinate to get that done around the same time. Um, just the remaining roads we have on the list are just in pretty poor condition. Um, at this point, you've been through the process before. Uh, what the state has done, usually they put out a new bid every winter for uh, paving work. Turns out that they've decided to extend last year's prices. So with the extension of last year's prices, Tilcon is still the low bidder and is recommended by staff for uh, extending uh, or increasing their existing PO to cover the work this spring answer any questions anyone might have. Is anybody, anybody have any questions for Derek? Councilman Forrest. Just a quick note, Derek, on that map where you were trying to show a visualization of the roads paved over two decade year periods, it probably would be pretty important to put in all the state roads and the state ones that were done because those are big uh, missing spaces that were actually paved in some, some respects over the last 10 years. So for more comprehensive, you know, any other any other entity which does pave roads. And then also if there are sort of like, and I'm not sure of this, but if there are private roads on there that are not within the scope of the town of Wethersfield to redo on a regular basis, those should either be highlighted, removed or colored or something. So we could, from a visual standpoint, if you're trying to get a feel for that percentage to make sure that the percentages are done properly. So if I were to ask you, you know, you indicate that 30 something percent was done in the 10 year period, I'm gonna say, does that, did that include does that 30% include the state roads or not include the state roads? No, that was just based on town roads. Right. So from the, from the visualization, it might be, uh, you know, maybe to include those or not include those just to get a little bit more of a comprehensive look at the paving process. But yeah, to your point, the map is not showing roads that were paved by the state that uh, just shows additional um, work that's been done in town. So yeah, we can, uh, whatever information I get out of DOT, we can add that to the map and just have it more complete in that respect. I also had a little bit of a who, I mean, I was texting Ryan a little bit. There's no, there's no secret here that the portion of Jordan Lane that goes up, you know, in the back there where we dumped some of that stuff was paved. <laughs> I, I think the, the use of that road is probably pretty limited, but um, is there, is there a process? Is, is Jordan Lane a state road? Jordan Lane uh, to the west of Silas Dean Highway is a state road. They recently paved it. Um, the project we're going to be doing extends north of Jordan Lane, just to the east of Goodwin Park, up into up to the Hartford City Line. Right. Is there a process by which we might be able to extend some of those roads, like uh, to become state roads, so it sort of comes off of our responsibility and, and, of course, budget responsibility? Like, you know, Wells Road extends to Main Street in Old Weathersfield, right? To be able to remove that and put that onto a state budget might be a nice uh, move off of our. Uh, you know, of the onus of what we've got, especially considering all the previous comments we just talked about from a revenue standpoint. How do we, what's the process to, to move them on to like a state, just continue that state route? 
I've never been involved in that process, so I can't answer that. Um, you know, I just based on dealings with DOT and funding issues they're having at the state, just like we are, I think it's that that's going to be a tough sell. Um, there are a couple roads, like I mentioned, Jordan Lane is one where we own to the east of Silas Dean Highway, they own to the west. Knott Street is very similar. They own to the east of Silas Dean Highway, and we own to the west. How that came to be, I don't know. Um, you know, it's something we could we can have a discussion with them about, but I'm not sure exactly how that process would go forward. I, I will say, you know, when, when they have sidewalks in there right away, they put it on the town to maintain the sidewalks. When there's drainage issues, they often will push, try to push it back on us. So to get them to accept roads that have been town for a long time, I think will be a tough sell, to be honest. Yeah. Might be nice, uh, Gary and, and Derek and the mayor to, to see if we could get a meeting of our state delegation. And you know, sometimes these are just adding half miles here, half miles there. But it would be nice to be able to take off of our responsibility, and uh, especially when they're just such obvious continuations of other state roads, like Main Street and Old Weathersfield is clearly a continuation of Wells Road, for example. Um, Two Rod Highway might be another piece, you know, and uh, and they'll get paved with more frequency, as you can see, than, than necessarily we get to over. Oh, we're looking at a thirty-year plan now, so I think it's going to be quicker than that. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions for Derek at all on this? I guess my question, Derek, uh, I don't know where we are with the timetable for Wolcott Hill just yet to uh, north of, um, yeah, I guess north of Jordan to the town line, city line of Harford. I know in the past we've always wanted to kind of keep our um, paving centralized and located where, you know, you're not paying additional costs to send equipment from one end of the town to the other end of the town. Um, I noticed that this is, you know, uh, just north of Knott Street and in close proximity to Wolcott Hills project. Is there, a, could that be tied in at all? Or are we um, ready to start work at, um, at that Wolcott Street or Wolcott Hill um, portion? Yeah, that, that project is separate from our paving program because it's completely state funded. So at this point, we're at about a 35% design stage. Uh, we're expecting to submit to CROG this week to solicit comments, which is the normal process. And then uh, the consultant will be moving along to the next submittal, which is 90% uh, design submittal. So um, with regard to those, they're gonna be totally separate. Uh, we'll be doing our work. Uh, you know, this this program is going to occur April May timeframe. Um, at this point, I'm expecting that project to get out to bid this year and get started this year. But I'm I'm sure it'll be more of a late summer start um, later than ours. We'll probably be into our fall program when this starts, and we'll be in a different area at the time. Okay, and then um, kind of to follow up off of what Matt was saying with the uh, color coded map, uh, a lot of the the roads that have not been done within the last two decades. Um, you know, and this is just a technical question. Is the asphalt of the, you know, prior, let's go back 40, 50 years, is that different than the asphalt that is being laid in today's day and age? I mean, is, is has technology advanced so much that, you know, the, the roads that were paving in, you know, 2001 to 2010, 2010 to today, will hold up longer than roads that were paved in the 60s and 70s? I, I can't say for sure. I, I will say I have heard um, some people who feel that the, the pavement quality is not as good as it used to be, so not necessarily. I think you know we have a lot of roads that have not been paved in quite a long time, probably in excess of 30 or 40 years that we're still working to get to. Um, you know, roads typically a mill and overlay road, you're looking to get 15 years out of it, a reconstruction 20, 25 years out of it. So we're, you know, with the roads we're doing, even on a 30 year cycle is, is, is not ideal. It's probably double the time that would be ideal. But I think, you know, as far as how we've been progressing, I think we're, we're getting through them as quickly as we can. And um, a lot of the roads that we're doing now, um, I've gotten to the point where we're going to do full reclamation projects. So we're going to grind up all the existing pavement, grade out a new base, and then put all new pavement down. Those roads will last longer than roads that um, we usually just mill and overlay just because you 
you're basically getting a fully new reconstructed road, which is the reason why maybe in the last 10 years, the amount of roads we did was a little bit less because we did more reclamation and reconstruction work than just mill and overlay. And I think that's why, that's why that number's showing up that way. That's why I was saying, you know, for the next third, I suspect just to, you know, in looking at it, that it would take more than another 10 years because I think we're gonna be doing more of those reconstruction projects that are more costly. So assuming everything stays equal as far as funding, um, that would be my expectation. Okay, thank you for that. And anybody else with any questions for Derek? Okay, um, can I get a motion for this item? I'll make a motion to increase the existing Tilcon Connecticut Inc. purchase order by 250,000 in order to furnish and place bituminous concrete during the next paving program. Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you, Derek. I think you're up again. This is time for prep work, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, this is another agenda item related to the paving program in the spring. Um, as many of you know, uh, General Paving is an on-call contractor. They've been working with the town for many years. Uh, we're in the last year of their contract right now. Um, they are working under an extension that is uh, using bid prices that are 10% lower than their 2014 bid prices, which was the last time uh, the project, uh, this contract was bid. Um, so the pricing has been pretty good. Um, they've been very helpful with staff. Um, they do minor drainage work. They do road patching, uh, curb and driveway apron replacements. They remove excess material when we do these reclamation projects and they help with maintenance protection of traffic. Um, they, I look at them as an extension of the town staff. They help with scheduling, coordinating the program and the contractors. Um, so with that, I'm requesting an increase to their existing PO to cover the cost of this program coming up. Does anybody have any questions for Derek on this? Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I don't know if this is the appropriate time to ask the question, but <clears throat> Why is traffic control such a huge component of these projects, dollar wise? Is there any way we can work to reduce that cost or we're spending more on traffic control than we are on asphalt? And this just doesn't seem right. Well, are you referring to this, this request for general pavings increase? Because yeah. I, mean, I mentioned that, but that's only a small component of what they do. Typically, uh, the cost is somewhere around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year. Uh, a program, I'm sorry, for traffic control versus a program where we're doing seven, eight hundred thousand dollars worth of work. So it's a it's a small component. The increase here in their in their uh, PO is really for all the other work they do. I mean, a lot of it comes down to the the curbing, the aprons, and that type of work, the drainage work that they do. They always uh, we replace new catch basin tops and they replace structures and we add structures as needed depending on the conditions that we find. I'm just looking at their pricing sheet. Item three. It's a unit LS, I'm not sure what that is. 175,000 unit price for 2014. Okay. Just let me pull that up. I can see what you're talking about. Yeah, and that was okay. Traffic control. I see what you're saying. Yeah, LS is for a for lump sum. Um, so we did a th three year extension in the last column, thirty six months. That was the total price for all six programs. So in that case, I guess we're looking at more like twenty five thousand dollars a program for that. That's what that is. So we divide that by six. So that was over the full length of the contract. That was the total amount we were okay. paying. Thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Jumping out at me, like. Yeah, makes sense. Can you on that, Councilman Force. I'd like to follow up on that because, uh, Tom, maybe you got it, but I'm still trying to. I'm going to unpack that a little bit more. Um, 
if we're asking for a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar increase, correct to the to the paving program or one hundred eighty five. One hundred eighty five. Sorry about that. That was awesome. So is this what comprise? Is this list on? Uh, is this list which includes that one fifty seven five? The this one hundred eighty five thousand dollar increase. No, this this list that you're looking at that was attached as supplemental information just shows the unit prices for this work. Uh, most of it is based on the actual unit itself, whether it be a lineal foot or a square foot or uh, each item. Um, the one we're talking about for traffic control, the way that contract was set up back in 2014 was it was set up as a lump sum item where they get paid a you know a percentage of that. So the last column where it says $157,000 is for that three-year contract. So that means each program, that's six, typically six to seven programs, depending on how we break it out. That's what they would get paid over the three-year extension as a total lump sum. That's different than some of the other items that you'll see that are, are just for a lineal foot of pipe or a square foot of um, apron that's being done. We pay, we measure those up in the field when they do it. And that's how we determine what they get paid. So the request I'm putting in is based on an estimate, looking at what their costs were compared to the overall program in recent years that we have the data for. And then we use that to, to come up with a number that I think will cover their cost. The cost is more than 185. It's just that, you know, I overshoot purposely to be a little bit conservative. So there's some funding left in their PO that wasn't spent. Therefore, I'm just looking for an increase that would cover the amount I think we're going to need for the next program. So the 185 increase is, is over what? Is that over the like one point whatever million we spend a year? No, this is part of it. No, this, the, the, the components of the paving program generally are our paving contract, which very often we've used state contracts, which I, we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Our, our milling and reclaim contract, which is also a state contract that we use historically for the pricing and general paving. It's those three components. I'm not here tonight for the milling and reclaim only because DOT has not issued their bid solicitation yet for that. So we're, everybody's waiting to see if they're going to extend their contract like they did with the paving or they're gonna get something out very quickly because construction season's approaching. So I'm still waiting on that determination before I come back to you for that, for that approval. But those three contracts or those three requests I come in for constitute the program. So this is part of that. Yeah, okay. I think I see it on the other page. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Derek? Being none, uh, is there a motion for this? I'll make a motion to increase the existing purchase order for general paving by $185,000 uh, in order to complete the site preparation and restoration work, drainage improvements, and additional support services associated with the town's next paving program. Second. Second. Sue, did you get that? Okay. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded on this item. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Great. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for the explanation on these. Um, and I guess, you know, the only question would be when do you think we would start to see some of this? You said early April. Typically, uh, yeah, I suspect general paving will start their work as soon as the weather improves sometime in March, um, early April. Right now, we're scheduling out the paving work early May, so I'm ex expecting it to be an April, May type of program. Okay, and uh, affected residents and um, driveways would be notified and everything. Yes, all the butters get a standard letter that gives them information on who the contractors are when we're doing the work, gives them contacts for our, our department so they can get a hold of us if there's any issues. Um, we're out in the field as well. And it gives them some just basic information on how to get in and out of the driveway safely. Mm -hmm. And uh, paving programs are typically regular business hours. Rarely do we see anything going overnight milling or overnight um, paving. 
Yeah, it's rare that would happen for for our basic program outside of a special contract. Um, no, it's usually a seven to three or four o'clock operation. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night, Eric. And uh, Sally came on, and we've got um, item B four D. This is the diesel uh, fuel bid. And uh, I guess just before um, we discuss this, I just wanted to, in the action required, um, Gary, it does mention heating fuel in the motion. I just wanted, it's still my understanding that we don't purchase heating oil in this contract or do we have it tagged on to it? A bid comes through CROG as a, as, as with two parts. Okay, so the bid so that's is- why the, the title of their bid is diesel fuel and heating oil. Okay, but we're not purchasing heating right. oil through this particular bid. Yeah. Gotcha, okay, that clears that up. Well, Thank good, you. A good point to raise for clarification. I can't truly accept the gratitude for that. I think deputy mayor may have Pick that up earlier and let me know about it. Way to go, Mass. <laughs> Always in and then. Oh, that guy again. No, it's, um, it's okay. a good catch. We we just follow the, the kind of the terminology in the bid. Um, but so just and I'll do a quick lead in and then Sally, you can correct me um, as I go. But um, based off of the conversation that we had at the first meeting in February, um, this is very similar. This this seems to be coming up. Um, within discussions, uh, several council members have mentioned um, over the last 12 months. You know, unfortunately, there seems to be, especially when it comes to commodity bidding, um, and when we deal with a consortium, um, the fact that we we don't have as much control over the timing of it. Um, however, the consortium <laughs> bring on uh, specialists, individuals who work within the field, who are better um, adept at understanding the markets. Um, so. What I've seen historically over the last uh, few years with my involvement or at least monitoring of the town is twice a year, once a year we do a gas, um, we piggyback on a gas bid and once a year we piggyback on a diesel bid. Uh, one is typically end of uh, winter. Um, the other one is, or I guess it should say big beginning of winter and then the other is in, um, uh, in the latter part uh, in the following year. So end of the year, beginning of the year is probably a better explanation. This is the diesel bid. I'm once again coming to you, um, asking for council's consent to um, accept the CROG bid. It's very unique in the fact that I think they're opening bids tomorrow. Friday. Uh, okay, so this week. Uh, so we wouldn't have a council meeting. Our next council meeting is multiple weeks away. We might miss the opportunity to capitalize on, um, on the recommended lowest bid as it comes out. Um, this week. So uh, with that, I'll kind of step back and let Sally do her thing, or if there's any questions that you have for either of us, happy to answer. Thank you, Gary. Sally? Um, it is, that is pretty much what, what uh, the town manager has said. Krog has gone out to bid. They've worked with their consultants about trying to um, get bids at the most opportune time, which would give us the lowest possible price. And just as a clarification, these are prices that while we, uh, while it is February, this locks in a price for this contract starts in July. And so, but they have found historically that by going out to bid around this time, it's never a specific date, working with their consultants around this time of, of year, you get the best pricing and that the vendors are willing to hold to those prices because of the amount of fuel that's being purchased, even though it doesn't start for another, you know, until the, until the next fiscal year. Okay. Does anybody have any follow-up questions to Sally on this? No? Okay. I mean, 
It looks good. Do we have um, any idea that, um, you know, the 71,000, well, let's see, that's gasoline. We did the gasoline purchase in the right. fall. This is 32,000. 32,000 for uh, diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, that we, we base that number and you're comfortable with that number. I mean, it's what do we typically go through? Yes, we modify year? that number based on the amount of vehicles we have that utilize that particular type of fuel and, and we're good. And again, a lot of times when we work in these types of contracts, um, you know, we're, we're very watchful and we count every gallon that we use. So we don't go out and buy, you know, more than we need. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Sally or Gary on this at all? Thank you. Is there a motion for this? Oh, Councilman O'Connor. Sorry, Mayor. Yes, I'll make a motion to authorize the town manager to execute a contract utilizing the February 21st CRI bid pricing for the purchase of diesel fuel. I'm going to leave out. Motion has been made and seconded on this bid. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. And I think that uh, presentation that you and Derek put together uh, at the last meeting, and I know uh, Gary had shared that, was very informative. So um, thank you for putting that together and uh, just, you know, guiding us through it uh, two weeks ago. Okay. Great job. We do not have any ordinances or resolutions for introductions at this point. Uh, I believe everybody has a copy of the minutes. So if you can take a look at the February 1st minutes and um, we'll get a motion to approve those shortly. And if anybody's got any comments about those corrections. Okay, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of February 1st? 2021. I'll move to approve the minutes of February. What was the date? First. First. First, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to approve the minutes has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstain. Aye. Oh, abstain for Councilman Forrest. Thank you. And uh, we'll go into public comment. Uh, town manager, do we have anybody on the line for public comment? Yes, we do, Mayor. Uh, 860-402-8087. Please state your name and address again for the record, as well as, uh, and you'll have five minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's Shannon Roach again calling, uh, 104 Surrey Drive. I just want to say thank you um, for listening and acknowledging um, what we have said tonight and what we have been saying uh, throughout our calls. Um, it really means a lot that the leadership has taking a step in a, in a positive direction to, to sit there and, and acknowledge that calls that are coming in are, are, are offensive and are not um, what we should be looking for um, during our town council meetings. Um, while uh, Deputy Mayor, I agree with you that, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, not um respond to some things and respond to other things and it opens up a it opens up a, a door there for everybody you know um i do believe that 
um, coming together as leaders of our community and just saying, you know, be respectful on these calls. Um, if we are going to lead with uh, profanity laced uh, hate uh, speech, it's not welcome. And, and, and I think that that is something that we can all agree upon just as, you know, respecting each other as neighbors um, and community members. So um, I would just put that out there, but I, I definitely uh, thank you guys for uh, listening and acknowledging. I, I really appreciate it. So everybody have a nice evening and I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Shannon. And, and thank you for staying on the line for the entire meeting. We appreciate you uh, um, being part of this. Thank you. Okay, next number 860-838-1453. Hello again, everyone. It's Paul Brady, 1618 Church Street. I just wanted to say thank you guys for listening. And I also wanted to, uh, like Shannon, echo, um, you know, thanks to the deputy mayor for sharing his points. I, I have been a public servant since I left college. I've worked as a legislative aide, so I do understand the Roberts rule and not being able to have a dialogue back and forth. Um, I would also like to just offer a solution, uh, like my, one of my former boss. I uh, used to do, uh, while you can't have a dialogue back and forth during public comment, you can always make a comment when it's your, when you're, you've moved out of uh, public hearing and, and, you know, just say what's on your mind. And just so that the residents understand how you feel about things, um, that is always a good way to lead on, um, at least. Or at least that's in my belief, because again, no one reads minds. We will get a better feel for you and understanding if we hear what comes out of your mouth. We don't read minds. And, um, but just thank you guys for all that you're doing for the town. And again, for um, celebrating Black History Month, we really do appreciate it. And thank you for all you do for the town. Have a good night. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I'll echo the same thing I said to uh, Shannon. Thank you for uh, your comments and for staying on the line throughout the entire meeting. Uh, we do appreciate hearing from you. Okay. Next caller is 860-563-6923. Good evening again, this is Robert Young from 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I'd like to comment on the discussion you had with Derek Greger uh, regarding the, pay, the spring paving program. And I know it was mentioned that you know, he showed us a, uh, I should say he showed us a uh, color coded map. And then of course it was mentioned by, I believe Mr. Forrest, that uh, he thought that the state highways should all, if they are paved, I guess, they should also be colored red, like Weathersfield paint, colors their streets that have been paved red. And I disagree with that. I, I think that that's a, you should color, you should color the state highways a totally different color, such as a green or, or something else to show that those are not your streets. You don't, they're not your responsibility. I think what Mr. Forrest was trying to indicate was color them the same color as Weathersfield streets if they were paved recently. And that would show or deceive anybody reading it, looking at it. They say, oh, wow, that's a, that's a Weathersfield street, when in fact it's really a state highway. And I think the state highway should be totally and identified differently than a town highway. And um, I, I just think, uh, you know, for a reader, it would be more clearer and you'd understand 
I, I, by loading it up with all those reds, including the state of Connecticut's highways, painting them red makes look like, looks like we're doing even a bigger job than what we're doing. And, and you shouldn't do that. That's deception. So I, I would suggest you, you color the, red, the, the, the state of Connecticut highways one total color, identify it on your, uh, on your um, legend that those are state highways. They don't have anything to do with the town of Wethersfield, and, and that's it. Now, also, to, re to request or ask Mr. Gregor to try to see if we could get some of our streets identified as state highways, I think is extremely inappropriate. Inappropriate from the point of view that he's only a manager of whatever his department is called. Public, I don't think he's public service. I don't know what his organization is called, but that is the responsibility, I believe, of the town manager. Mr. Forrest should have been pointing to the manager and asking him to go do that. That's, he, is, he is the leader, and the leader goes to the state, not one of the, man, the, the town's managers. So I just, want, I just think that you know, we need to clarify and, and know who, who's responsible here for certain things. And Mr. Gregor, I don't believe, is responsible to go to the state and ask them to change these street, some streets or what streets they are over to state highways. Um, the next thing, um, you say, you're sending the, that sale of land, 15 acres of land to other commissions. And, and I'm sure they're not going to be val evaluating them based on the dollar amount. But you know, Guys, you paid, you, 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 it looks like if you sell the property at 15.9 acres of land to the Wethersfield Game Club, it looks like you're going to be receiving approximately $1,896 per acre. And I come back and I ask you, how in the world did you justify paying $75,000 an acre for the same wetland, same kind of wetlands on the Keisha farm. I think you people owe us an, an answer to that. How you justified, how you just, and Mr. Forrest is one who voted for it. I believe you, Mayor, you voted for it. And you're, you're probably the only two on this commission, on this uh, um, town council that voted for it. And I think, and I think, yeah, right. And. I believe $1,800 is a good price. I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying $75,000 per acre for wetlands was an extremely outrageous price for the town to pay. Now, it goes back to the discussion earlier with our state of Connecticut representatives and senator. Who, you know... Why do people leave the state of Connecticut? It's because of actions that you did. This town council, not this town council, the prior one did with the, with the Keisha farm. Mr. You, you you're paid such an enormous amount of money for something that today you're looking at selling for $1,886 per acre. And we'll continue this conversation. It's town of Wethersfield paid 75,000 and you're going on credit. You went out on bond, which means there's also interest on that. And then furthermore, your buy, your, the guy to the Wethersfield game club is saying, they're going to pay you cash, $1,886, where you bought the Keisha farm for, on the average, 75000 an acre on bond, which means you've got to tack interest and other costs onto it as well. Okay. What a disgrace that town okay. council was. And we here will we had Amy Bell sitting in front of us tonight, meeting. who led a non-transparent operation to buy that piece of property. She hoodwinked everybody in town. She, and, she hoodwinked her oh, own people. Mr. Young? And she was a disgrace. Now, I don't Mr. know. 
I think I, we I, have to- you know, I can be con- criticized and I should be censored, Mayor, for talking like this. Mr. Young? No, that was my fault. Hold on. Well, he did say he should be censored. Oh. Now I can't get him back on, though. Hold oh, on. no. Bob, you might have to hit star six again. Mr. Young, can you hear us? We trying to get him back on, Carrie? He's still online, um, but I don't know if his. He probably doesn't realize he got disconnected. He's probably still uh, talking to us. I mean, I, I think he gets a little thing where I say asked on mute. I think it comes up. Bob, if you can hear us, I think you have to. Hit... Hey, no. Mr. Young, if you can hear us, please press star six. There you go. I, I can hear you. Okay. You were unfortunately muted. Only for so, the last, well, I don't know. When, 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 when was, was I purposely muted? No. Or, or, or by accident? That was by accident. By I, accident. Oh, I take thank you. Thank you. I take responsibility for it. And this is Gary, by the way. Um, I think the last comment was that you should be censored. Unfortunate timing of me doing that. It well, I. Okay. But I, if you can. Okay. What, what I, I, I'd like to move right on. Your do, comment. Do, do, I think the last thing I wanted to say, Mayor, was that I had a, that the town clerk had made a comment regarding her uh, her work and how during this pandemic uh, things are so much more difficult. And I recently this week had to call upon her for something, and she 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 did something that ne- never I never received before as far as a service goes from her office. And I just wanted to let you know, I think she, she, um, she was very efficient and uh, uh, she provided an extraordinary service to me. Thank you. That is good to hear. Thank you, Mr. Young. Any other callers? Gary. I'm afraid. Um, I'm afraid to accidentally touch the screen. Uh, I th- nope, that is, that is all currently there. Okay. Thank you. And there's uh, no executive session. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Nays? <laughs> Didn't think so. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Have a great week, everybody. Everybody. Be safe. Be safe out there.